Zero four zero Alpha, confirm that's bombs dropping on Mazdrak. Fucking hell! There we go. How are we doing, Wilsey? Not bad, fucker yourself. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, a lot better than you. I've not been out in the out in the field for the past how long? Since Tuesday, mate. I wouldn't call it being out in the field exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Where were you? Just about to tune in area. Yeah, mate, yeah. It's fucking what she like. What are you doing? Just like a little uh, platoon exercise or something? Yeah, mate. So, so I'm down in Perth, right? So I'm training the phase one recruits. All right. So, yeah, it's pretty, pretty it's basic of the basic, mate. <laughs> really, really basic. Like, but yeah, it's been, it's been good, mate. We've been here since March last year, so yeah. But, Bit of an eye opener. Who goes to Purbright? Like, what? What's it for? Oh yeah, mate. So Purbright is basically for all the like the Remy Air Corps. I'm gonna I'm gonna say it, mate. All all, all the ramps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's this. Yeah. It's quite good actually. Yeah, you know, I was dreading coming here to start with. Yeah, I didn't know what to expect, but nah, it's, it's actually all right. Like, um, I'm guessing that you're gonna have a lot of downtime as well. Yeah, especially with this fucking COVID going on, mate. Because it's been wild, like. How's it, how's, it been, how's it been? Like, what sort of things have you had to implement? Um, so when, when the lockdown started, um, Purbury emptied, mate. All the recruits got sent home. And then we had to start doing virtual training, so we're like, doing it over Zoom and stuff like that. Mate. Yeah. Are you taking the press? Nah, mate, it was, it was emotional, like. Oh, my God. What sort of shit were you doing? Well, we were quite lucky, mate. So my, my recruits that I had in at the time were uh, we only had three weeks left, so we had taught them everything. Yeah. So there was nothing really to to teach them really. So it was just basically getting them to do a little um shit stuff like yeah, make a poster about fucking terrorism and fucking oh shit. It was just trying to keep them busy, mate, trying to get get them motivated. I don't know. I've talked to somebody else about it. I don't know why they, I don't know why you would uh, like I mean, separate books and stuff like that. If they've been, if they're literally living together and like in the block, like does it not make sense to just isolate the whole platoon as a owner? Or what was it? What was the reason why that couldn't happen? Uh, well, you know what's like, mate. That's that's common sense. We don't we don't do things that it's too much common sense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mate, it's above me, mate. To be honest with you, I yeah. Couldn't tell you. Yeah. yeah. I, um. Yeah, I was telling Arnie about um, um, Cammy's at depot at the minute as well, and he was put a post up, and uh, it was him and he was at the back of the, of a CFT, and they were doing a, a social distance CFT in the back training area. Yeah, mate. Yeah. I seen it. And, like, literally, I had to like you know the the way it, like finishes on the Instagram story and it goes to the next one. Yeah. I was like, I was like mind struck, so I had to like go back and double take, and I was like. Went back to the story. I was like, "Are you doing a social distance fucking CFT?" But uh, <laughs> yeah, messaged him, mate, and he's like, "Yeah, it's not really a social distance, but it is kind of it." So I'm like, "Oh my god, man!" Yeah, yeah, it's, it's the same here, mate. So the stuff like uh, like the runs, they're not meant to like run. They like do when they do the two K assessment. It's changed the bleak test, mate, because they're worried in case if they're running behind somebody, they'll catch COVID from them. It's fucking wild. <laughs> <laughs> the fucking young fit lads, man. There's at least the worries. <laughs> All right, so I'm guessing first podcast. It is me, yeah. <laughs> it sounds funny, mate. Like me saying that because it still doesn't really feel like it's in, like it's actually anything. It's it's uh it's got a good bit of traction uh, recently, but it still just feels like you know a fucking laugh, like a bit of a hobby, but. Technically, I guess it is a fucking published podcast, so yeah, I'm out there. I know you. Uh, I think it'll it'll pick up momentum, mate. I think it's quite good. It's, it's quite a good idea as well. 
I mean, um, there, there's one of my uh, one of my section commanders here. He was talking for a while about getting set up a podcast up and just uh, just to spin dits, mate. And then I showed him your one, and he said, like, "Fuck, it's still my idea, man." <laughs> 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 You're not past your last, mate. I know. I went to. Uh, I, I was going to call it uh, the Pull the Pin Podcast, um, yeah. and I, I set it all up. I got all like uh, the YouTube page and everything set up, and then I was going to schedule it to do the first one awarding. And then I was like, "Fuck, I better check that no one else has got the same thing." And sure enough, I checked, and it was a rugby podcast called Pull the Pin. I was like, fucking bastards. So I had to go and change it. And then I came up with lead wasps. But um, it was about four. I'd done about four or five of them. And then I went to check if anyone else was actually doing a podcast. And then I yeah. came across this one called Hate Shower Podcast. Yeah. I think it's, I'm not even too sure. I think it's a, a para that's doing it. But yeah, I'm not, don't quote me on that. But um, yeah. I messaged them and says, oh, that's awesome that you've got podcast going to go. And I said, I've just started one very similar. Um, all the best. And, Kind of went back and forth for a wee bit, but yeah, right. his, uh, his is he just filmed the uh, episode 100, so he's like a couple a year or two down the line from me, but he's doing well. Yeah. Apparently, it seems it looks like he's doing well. Uh, how are you finding it, mate? With uh, obviously doing this and then like doing what you're doing, like your normal like work. Uh, like, so normal I, work. I finish work at half six tonight, and then I've got a half like about a half hour commute, so I'll go yeah. in at seven. Um and then just got a quick snack to eat and then showered in that and set it up. But um it's honestly mate, it's a piece of piss because I'm what am I doing really? I'm going on to Zoom yeah. and putting an email address in and like we like we found out, I can't even fucking do that right. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's the fourth ro- fourth one in a row that it's fucked up and we've had to do it that set that uh alternate way, but I will get to the bottom of it, but like I said in the last one, I'm a fucking tech mom. But um, yeah. yeah, at least we'll get it, we'll get it going, and then um, yeah, I'll, I'll fix that later on. Um, but yeah, it's, it's honestly it's pretty easy um, setting it up and running it and stuff. The only like the hardest thing is probably trying to uh, push it on social media and stuff like that. I'm really not yeah. uh, into like. Um, you know, f- finding the algorithm and, you know, making sure it's going to hit all the points in the algorithm yeah. on that. I'm just like, fuck it. I'll just put out a story every now and again, you know, <laughs> put a fucking post up and then, you know, comment a few shit comments on other people's pages and that's about it. But yeah, yeah, I'm definitely not in it for the, you know, for the full hog of trying to get ma- mass sponsorship and, you know, maximum engagement. Like I know my base, my base is infantry yeah. books. I do not want to go outside of that. Like, yeah. If people pick it up that aren't fantastic, that's brilliant because then you're <clears throat> going to obviously spread the word out there about what what boys are doing. But you know, my my audience is pre- pre- predominantly infantry boys that just want to hear fucking stories. Yeah. Um. But yeah, how have you how have you found it? Because as soon as I put the first one up, you're the first guy to get met, get in touch, and say brilliant, you know, sort of support, uh, and say you'd, you'd fucking like to come on, which is class. Um, how, how how have you found it? You know, listening to them. Yeah, I, I find it good, mate. Because I think it was uh, Arnie you were speaking to about. It. Uh, I think it was Arnie that mentioned it. You know, we. I think as as the infantry mate, we we're, we're, we're quite good at like spinning dits with each other, like talking shit with each other. But then once you separate, you know, you don't speak to anyone about anything that you've done or any fucking stories or whatever. And then also you've came along with this, and I think this has given quite a lot of people a chance to. Like reconnect and like visit some of those memories and stuff and like talk about it and openly like air it to to a public forum. So yeah, I think I think it's quite good, mate. It's it's quite a good idea. You know, it will pick up momentum. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it's going to be big. Like, I'm going to uh, I'm going to actually when it gets a bit more serious, I'm going to take some time out and actually really think about it as like a like a wholesome sort of project. Set a, uh, make out a set of core values and stuff like that and like I know my initial one is like I want to, I want to give people a platform to express themselves and yeah. you know like you said clear the air about a couple of things that maybe they've had grievances about or maybe they've you know they've um, 
they, they've got weighing it on their shoulders or whatever, you know, that they've done something in the past and they just want to finally get that time to put it out there to fucking everyone, just let everyone know what actually happened or, you know, it could be yeah. anything like that. Uh, but the main one is to let people express themselves, highlight people's careers, highlight how much fucking great work guys are doing, you know, all over the world and for not much money to be in, to be fair. Um, yeah, you don't, you don't join the fucking army to get rich, um, which people kind of forget, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the main thing behind it. And then, like I said, I'll, I'll probably, when it starts getting a bit more serious, I'll probably start taking it a bit more serious. But at the end of the day, like, like I said, I know my base, like my base isn't going to want to hear me talk fucking more eloquently <laughs> or start using big words or get fucking guests just for clickbait. Like we don't fucking yeah. want that. Guys just want honest fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's that's what the drama with some of these uh, podcasts that are out there. I mean, I, I don't listen to much. I'm more like audiobook. But um, yeah, for what you see, quite a lot of it's like all like clickbait. And it's it's the same with all these, the, the companies that are like the coffee companies and the t-shirt companies. I mean, it's still great work, what they're doing. Totally supportive. I mean, I buy the coffee and that myself, but you know, some of the t-shirt companies, mate, they, they sell their t-shirts by getting chicks to, to wear them. They're like all these crossfit <laughs> chicks. And it's fucking... <laughs> hey, don't fucking knock that, because that's my marketing plan. Sorry, mate. I, thought, I ruined it, mate. <laughs> I'm going to get some green fleet with my fucking, my lead wasp uh, podcast t-shirt on. <laughs> In the med centre or some shit like that. <laughs> But yeah, but I think some of, some of the companies just get lost to like the reason why they started it in the first place. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, like obviously, I, I want to keep that in mind as well. But um, yeah, uh, and like I'd, I'd like to say as well, just to before we really get into it, um, anyone that does want to come on and or does um, think they've got something to say or a story to tell, or even just want to have a fucking you know a discussion about anything you know infantry based or whatever you can find the fucking email address and email me and I'll either say, I'll do about, I'll, I'll do about three minutes due diligence and if it looks like you're a cunt, I'll probably just not reply. But if it looks like you're any sort of a, like a, like a decent guy, um, then yeah, I'll definitely schedule it. But yeah, let's uh, get into it then and we'll start off with a, a good old icebreaker. I'm not prepared for this. <laughs> Now, yeah, you know so now you know how your crow feel. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Hey, so yeah, so I'm uh, Wells, I'm a platoon sergeant in the Black Watch, uh, three Scots, uh, currently down in, in Purbury, the uh, training phase one recruits. Um, so yeah, um, been in coming up close to 20 years now in September. Um, six o'clock race tour, so I've been to Bosnia, um, Afghan twice, I've so been to Iraq, and then Iraq again doing Shader. And then um, a wee cheeky the box you won in Tosca as well. But um, yeah, just li- living the dream, mate. Living the dream. Nice. Um, that's a, that's funny that um, that you said you're living the dream because after 20 years, you you know a lot of guys would you know you'd maybe get the the guys like oh fucking can of wait to get out or whatever or um, you know sort of that attitude, but. To see, hear you say living the dream at the end of it just fucking says a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, mate, like I've got like six years left, so I took Veng and stuff, but uh, I'm actually shiting it, mate. Like, to, I, I don't know anything else apart from the army. Like, I left school at 15, started training at 16, mate. I never had a civvy job, so yeah. I, I don't know what I'm going to do, mate. <laughs> Fuck uh, knows. Yeah, I, I would say to that is really don't fucking worry about it because you're secure for the next six years. Guys getting yeah. out right now, oh my days, like there's no jobs, there's absolutely nothing going on at the minute. But in six years, man, it'll all be back to normal unless this fucking pandemic dukes coming around the corner. Uh, yeah. But yeah, like there should be a, a big thriving economy back then and the job market's full. But <clears throat> obviously I've just got out in the past two years and my experience is that if you are positive you're hard working you're willing to put in a bit of time on linkedin and fucking email just hundreds of cunts then you'll be all right um, yeah if you're going to sit in your arse and just expect somebody to hand you a job 
because you've done X amount of years in the army, then you'll probably fucking end up down a spiral um, and end up fucking living a shite life. But it's just, you get, you honestly really do get what you put in. Uh, yeah. Get back. Um, but it's like, like I said, you need to be emailing everyone. You need to decide what sort of thing you want to do. Um, and then just commit to that. Because when I got out, um, I was like kind of undecided. I'm like, it was kind of, it was kind of like a, a fast paced get out for me, but I was kind of undecided about what I was actually going to do. And I'm now doing uh, like sort of private security, executive security, but I never, ever, ever thought I would, you know, get into that line of work. It's just that when I came back to the UK, I, uh, and I struggled getting a job and just went and done a course. You do the course and then that's you qualified in that sector and you can, you know, you can start getting jobs there. Um, the CP, the CP uh, job market, I guess, is it's kind of uh, watered down, I would say. You know, there's a lot of people in there with um, a lot of competition. And from what I hear about guys that have been here, been in the industry for years, is that it's the worst it's ever been. But at the end of the day, there's still jobs and they're still paying you. Yeah. Uh, but yes, yeah, like anything, if you just, if you were to like take the six years you've got now, just decide on what you're going to do when you get out, then you can start building up courses and building up, you know, a set of skills in that fucking avenue. And then just by the time you get out, have it all squared away, you know? But yeah, I mean, it's just it's just picking something. Yeah, that's the hardest bit. I mean, you hear quite a lot of people say like the CP and the offshore, but but like you said, it's got its peaks, so it's got its rises where the the work's good, and then there's times where it's not so good. Quite a lot of people get paid off as well, don't they? In the the offshore sort of side of things. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, six years so. I get quite a lot of chance down here, quite a lot of free time when uh, I'm not teaching the stuff to do personal development. So it's, it's stuff that I've looked into. Yeah. Yeah, we'll just, just see what comes, mate. <clears throat> you know what may be a good opportunity when you're down there is uh, to knock yourself out on fucking like these AT quads. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like uh, rope access and all that. I don't even know if you can get that, but like get some fucking rope access quads or even like I don't know, fucking know, mountain bike calls or anything. Just take as much as you can because it's fucking, yeah, you know, you can get, any, get anything given to you in Civil Street. <laughs> I mean, you, 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 give your, you give your all in the army, don't you? So you need, you need to take what you're given. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess so. But so what, you said you finished school at 15 and you never, did you say you never got any calls or you just fucking after... What 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 was the deal with there? Yeah, so I just left it. I've always I've always wanted to be in the army. So my old man was sixteen years in the navy, um, and at the time my brother was trying to join up as well. So he's in he's in the Marines, mate. And um, yeah, it's just my, my dad sort of not like pushed me into the army, but you know he he's been there, experienced, been in in military life, and at the time there was really nothing. You know, I wasn't good at school, mate. I wasn't wasn't the smartest, wasn't the brainiest. Um, so the army was uh, the better option, mate. But um, the the thing that cracks me up is down here, mate. So there's quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of trades. You know, you need to be quite brainy for it. But the the recruits are fucking chapping, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I always say to myself, like, I, I remember going, I remember going to the careers office, mate. And um, they, they gave me like, the big jobs, a list you can do in the army. And I was like, ticking off fucking, I said, like, I want to be an RMP, I want to be like a mechanic, and all that, like the jobs that I'd get a trade from. And the recruit was like, yeah, mate, so you just do this fucking barb test, we'll get, get a score and stuff like that. Done the test, mate. And I must have got like fucking minus 10 or something, because he came back from a list of like 50, like down to one, and it was just infantry. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yeah, it's all that jobs you picked. Yeah, forget them. Yeah, th this will suit you more. <laughs> then you've got, you've got people here, mate, who are like, 
joining the signals to be like electronic warfare specialists and stuff like that. And you think, fucking hell, no, it's just a little bit more brainy and a little more, a little bit more tuned in to school or, you know, just worked a bit harder. I could have had a better trade. Not that it would change what, what I've done for, for anything. But yeah, it's just, it's an eye opener, mate. You know, and I'm still learning different types of jobs now in the army. I didn't yeah. know it was either. Mate, I, uh, I started reading, mate, when I was 27. Like, I never read a full book until I was 27. And uh, so now I read, like, every, like, a third, like, a half hour every day. And the amount that I feel like I've got, the, the, the amount of increase in sort of, like, brain power, if you want to call it that, for lack of a better word, you know, I'm, I'm obviously clearly still working on this. <laughs> can't get my fucking word out. Um, yeah, so then... Uh, the increase in knowledge I would say that I've got from just reading has been incredible, man. Like, like I'm, I'll read fucking anything. Um, like I just read a book there. It's called the five. It's about five women that, um, Jack the Ripper murdered. And it's yeah. always pretty boring, but it's, it's just something to fucking read and something to keep my brain ticking over. But before that, I actually felt like my brain was disintegrating. Like I felt like I was like by the week getting more and more stupid. Um, <laughs> So I made a conscious effort. I was like, right, I'm going to stop fucking doing something about this because I feel like I'm honestly just going to, by the time I'm 40, if I don't do anything, I'll just be mush. Yeah. But yeah, like, um, at the end of the day, like you said, like, if you if you hadn't joined the infantry, man, you wouldn't have had the, the life you've had and the experience you've had. No, no exactly, way, mate, yeah. no, no way in the world. Nah, no chance. I wouldn't change it, but, yeah, so like, sometimes they yeah, fucking mongrel to the recruits, but then, I come into the office mate, I'm like, well, actually, they're probably fucking a bit more brainer than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, a higher barb score, do <laughs> <laughs> It's funny, because at the time when you do that test, you're just thinking, what, 16-year-old, you're like, oh, fuck it, I'll get this test done quick, and just, I'm, I'm going to go down the shop and meet my mate or something like that. You get the time, you think absolutely nothing of it, but I guess it probably actually... Uh, Makes a big difference. Makes a big uh, has a big Im- impact on what career you end up t- taking. Yeah, I can't even right. remember doing a bar test. I, I must have done one, but honestly, I can't even remember doing one. I remember like uh, the questions like fucking Dave's bigger than John. Who's the smallest? <laughs> <laughs> You're like Steve. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's fucking mental, mate. But yeah, but as. Like you say, mate, you wouldn't change it because you wouldn't have done half the stuff, you know what I mean? If you were to be, I don't know, like if you were to join something else other than the infantry. Yeah. Just the experiences, mate. Like some of these guys now, especially like the guys in my training team, they've not been on tours, mate. No, they've been in like six, seven years and all they've done is just in the UK or like been away on exercise. Yeah. So, but... There is not many tours out now, anyway, is there? It's kind of not quiet, but. I was thinking this in, um, I can't remember when, but I was thinking this the other day. <clears throat> I was like, uh, there's probably going to be blokes in SF right now that haven't fired a weapon in anger. Yeah. You reckon? Oh, yeah, 100%. Mate. Let's say you got some that joins, that joins SF when they're 21, 22, maybe. Let's go back. So they have to that'd be four years. When's that take you back to 2016? Oh, guaranteed. 2015 even. There's guaranteed yeah. blokes in SF that haven't fired a, a weapon in anger. You know, just new guys that rocked up there. Yeah. That's yeah it's scary because then if you think about it, I mean, it's, you think, so that was only what, like four or five years ago to what it would have been maybe 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. How busy they would have been like constantly on the job, mate. Yeah. And definitely, firing your weapon in anger isn't a level of how it doesn't isn't a measure of how good you are. It's just a a, a kind of observation as to the state of what the military is doing at the minute. It's definitely not a level. Yeah. It doesn't say anything about how good you are as a soldier. It's just an observation. But um, <clears throat> what were we talking about? Fuck this, mate. I'm just turning my iPad on and you're on it. <laughs> one, one, and a half, one and a half down. I'm crumbling already. You're in, mate. Yeah, so where did you where did you start a career off then? So I started off in um, the Highlanders, mate. It's now four Scots. Yeah. 
Um, joined, joined them in Edinburgh, mate. Uh, June 2001. After training, so I'd done phase one in Glen Course, mate. I'd done um, what was called the Scottish School Weaver Scheme. So right. 24, weeks in, 24 weeks in Glen Course, mate. And then I'd done uh, the 14 weeks in Caddick. And yeah, I joined, joined the Highlanders in Edinburgh. Young, thrusty, and 16 year old, mate. Still had a head of hair. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the shine on that. Wait, I'm not that stage yet. In denial, in denial, mate. I've had to get rid of this because of the uh, obviously the the corona cut just went haywire, and I'm for oh, fuck it. I mean, now's the now's the perfect time to get rid of it. <laughs> so you joined in June, did you say, or June or July? So I started training in September 2000. And then, uh, yeah, yeah. Then, and then a couple of months later, September 11th happened. What were you thinking then? Yeah, mate. So when so the, the company I joined, uh, Delta Company, they were they were training with Kosovo at the time, and uh, there was me and one of the guys I was in training with. We were under 18, so we were both 16, and they made us. Uh, Work in officers' mess for six months, mate. So we're like mess wears. Fucking six months. <laughs> so we, yeah, we had done that. So we went to like Germany, done like live firing and stuff like that. Um, and then when it came to it, the OC was like, "Yeah, so we'll put you into the fucking officers' mess for six months, and then you can join the company back when you know we will come back from tour." But, but because you're young, you, you don't know how the army works, mate. You just say, yeah, okay, no worries. Yeah. But realistically, like, what was the drama in, like, moving us to a different company? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but no, so, like, six months in officer's mess, mate, and that was fucking, that, that was wild. Like, having to learn all the silver, like, feeding them fucking dinner, and it was just, and you're 16, mate, and you're doing that, and you think, why the fuck have I, like, joined the army? Like, yeah. why? Like, but, um, yeah, going back to September 11, mate, I remember it happening when I was in the fucking... I was in the TV room filling up the honesty bar. <laughs> <laughs> and it was on the news. I was like, what the fuck's going on here? But, yeah. And uh, I when, when you're 16, man, like, if I think back to when I was 16, I was a fucking idiot. Like, I was a complete idiot. Like, I'm... I, Still consider myself to be a bit of a fucking bit of a loose cannon. But when I was 16, <laughs> I was a complete clown with a fucking red nose and everything, mate. Um, so it's probably good they stuck you in that fucking mess instead of give you a rifle. <laughs> but yeah, I remember what's that, like, what's that hours were you putting in there? It must have been about 12 hour shifts. Fucking slave labour, mate. It was yeah. like uh, the earlies and late. So if you're on earlies, you would have to wake up at five, go down, set up for breakfast, put all the silver out. Fucking serve breakfast, take breakfast away, get lunch ready. It was fucking, if you're on late, mate, you're in at like one, you didn't finish till like 11. Okay. But yeah, it was, it was all right. And uh, like at the time when September 11th happened, did you, did it, did it resonate with you that this was something big? Um, you? I, I was like, yeah, we're going to fucking war. This is amazing. But then I was like, well, I'm only 16. They're not, if I can't go to Kosovo, they're not going to send me, they're not going to send me to war. I'm fucking, I'm fucking stuck in this mess, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I didn't go. I'm still the same now. I'm not really that big into politics and stuff. I don't really follow stuff, mate. So I wasn't really like tuned in to, like my, my biggest room. The thing I remember most about like September 11 was all the war protesters in Edinburgh mate, at the time, right? You no, know, just like protesting against war. So that's all I remember about about that sort of time. But then it went all quiet. Well, not quiet, but you no, know, you didn't really. There wasn't any whispers of war and stuff yeah. going on. I mean, I, I like I was much younger than you, <clears throat> and yeah, politics wasn't even on the radar. I probably didn't even know what politics was at the time. To tell you the truth, um, and like I never even knew that Afghanistan was even a thing. Um, yeah. I was in basic training, and I was like, "I want to, like." They were asking what unit you want to go to, and I says, "Oh, I'll go to the Black Watch." 
but I got forced to go there because they were next going next on tour and the the screw was like, oh, it'd be good for your career. So I was like, yeah, fuck it, I'll go there. Um, expecting to go to Iraq. And then like about four or five weeks before I leave basic training, they're like, oh yeah, you're going to the Black Watch. They're already deployed to Afghanistan. Or they're just deploying to Afghanistan next month or whatever. And I'm like, Afghanistan? Who the fuck is that? And they're like, uh, oh yeah, we're fucking war in Afghanistan. I'm like, fucking hell, it was news to me. I thought it was going to Iraq. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I went to Afghanistan. I had no clue about, you know, Tony Blair and the fucking WMDs and, you know, how it was built on a lie. And I had nothing, absolutely nothing. I just seen on the news that people were dying in that all the time. Seen videos on YouTube and stuff. And I was like, I just felt fucking compelled, like, I guess as a fucking patriot to do my part. Can you imagine if you like, I mean, there's thousands, millions of people that obviously didn't join the army, but imagine as you, as a, the type of person you clearly are sitting back and then just not doing something. It's just like, I don't know if I could fucking, and it's definitely not World War Two, but World War Two, but you know, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's I like, think, you, um, so if, obviously if you're an American, then you're all for it, aren't you? But the UK's they've got a different approach to everything now, I think, with regards to the army and stuff. We've never really had the support of it from the civilians. So the same sort of support the Americans get. Yeah. Yeah, they're all for it, mate. They're all patriotic and stuff, all for it. But if, if you were to act like that over here, you'll just get looked at like you're a weirdo. Well, that's because that's because Brits are different, though. With people like yeah. Brits, yeah, Brits are more humble. Brits are uh, less braggy, and you know, praising others isn't something that Brits do. Yeah. Um. Like we, like in America, they'll say, um, "Thank you very much. Have a nice day," or something like that. Like, how often do you hear somebody say, "Have a nice day"? Yeah, it's like, "Oh, just cheers or." See you or something like that. It's like yeah. it was just such a small thing, but it's like just like like an extra layer, if you know what I mean. But yeah, general, I think British people just aren't. They're more humble, I would say. And they, I'm not saying America. I, I wouldn't say that Americans ask for the um, the recognition, but it's definitely after being over there. It's definitely like they force it a lot. Like it's the second thing that comes out out their mouth after their name yeah sort of thing like i'm working with two boys at the infantry now i don't even know what ranks they were and i've been working with them for fucking four weeks yeah like, I, I know one of them was irish guards and one of them was a fusilier that is it like you know and had i been working with an american boy he would have told me every fucking thing that he'd yeah. been doing so i think yeah. i think british are just more humble and that's maybe why and I don't know if I, I don't know if I'd want everyone fucking, you know, kiss my feet every two minutes sort of thing. Nah, dude. Yeah. I don't know how to react to that, mate. Like, so when we're on Shader there, we worked with the, we had like two companies of Americans with us, mate, providing security for the airbase. And uh, I always remember they, they had like ISO containers full of these welfare boxes and they couldn't even give these things away, mate, to the Americans. So they gave them to the jocks and you think back to like Afghan when you got like the welfare boxes, mate. You open it up. What, what is it you get? You get like a packet of disposable razors, fucking cup of soups, like Tesco's own fucking toothpaste. Yeah. You you open the American box, mate. It's like a two man lift. <laughs> the, <laughs> the the first layer, mate. The first layer of this box <laughs> is about that thick of like letters and like school like drawings from school kids and. Jesus. You know, and you're, just, you're reading these, mate, and say, the school kids, are, yeah, you're my hero, and be safe soldier, and stuff like that. And then there's, like, letters from um, chief of police, like, letters from, like, the, the local fucking politician or whatever, mate. And then you, you get to, like, the, the meat of the box, so what you want. And there's, like, Under Armour baseball caps, there's, like, signed baseball oh, cards. Wow. It's wild, mate. And, you know, I think it's just the support they get. The, the, it's lacking for the, the British troops, I think. Yeah. In that sort of sense. I mean, don't get me wrong, we are grateful for what we get, like all these boxes. But if you look at comparison to what yeah. they get. Like, I don't, I don't know if, I, I feel like we've got a different opinion on this. Like, do you, is your opinion that we should get more, more praise or, 
Like we should get more public praise. Or more no, I wouldn't say praise. I wouldn't say praise, Recogn- wouldn't say praise or recognition. Of, I don't know. It's kind of like similar to like American sort of level. Yeah, just support wise. Do you know what I mean? So I think I think what it is is because the UK is that small, you've got uh, all these garrisons about, and obviously squaddies being squaddies go out and. You know, co- not cause carnage, but cause a little bit of fucking kerfuffle in the clubs, mate. And before you know it, it's like you, you don't get into places. You know, oh, the fucking squaddy always. Whereas in America, I think they've got a different stance. But then, like you said, mate, it's, it's like bred into them, isn't it? Like this, like so, like the flag in like primary school. Yeah. And, yeah. I'm not. <laughs> I th- I think it like and this might be a bit controversial, but I think it's I think that sort of mentality is too entitled. Like when I went yeah. to the states, I found it hard to take it to take like all the fucking discounts and stuff you'd get and just like queue skips yeah. and I'm like I'm fucking standing in the queue. I don't want a discount. Like I found it hard yeah, to like, yeah. take all that. Um, and then when they don't get it, like the the level of entitlement is crazy. It's like, yeah. do you know who the fuck I am? I fought for this fucking country. And I'm like, <laughs> Jesus Christ, man, chill the fuck out. You would get sparkled if you started fucking banting that shit in the UK, man. And too, right? Like, but, uh, yeah, I just think maybe the level of entitlement's probably. Yeah. But then it, I think the Americans are just a, a different breed altogether, aren't they? Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Completely, yeah. Completely different culture, but. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's like, uh, I, I just don't know if it's. That level of entitlement, entitlement is what I'd like to see. I'd like to see guys being more humble, um, yeah. even even though they are already extremely humble. You never hear anyone talk about being in the army or anything anywhere near as much as you do in, uh, in America, and that's a good thing, I think. But yeah, support oh, yeah, wise, yeah. taking care of the troops a different story. That's a different. Yeah. Story. Yeah. I think. Um, there's fucking so much more that could be done. I think setting up like uh, what the Americans do have is a like a, ver- a VA, a Veterans Affairs, which is like a military specific like um, NHS sort of thing. Yeah. So they go directly to the VA and get um, their doctor's appointments and get all like I don't know audio fucking testing and like any medical complaints they've had throughout their service, they get sorted at the VA or even just in general post service to get sorted at the VA. Um, I think maybe something like that might be good in the UK uh, rather yeah. than just being stuck in the NHS because then you've got practitioners that don't have any idea what the hell you've maybe been through. Like we talked with Halliday, but he he had a, a, a ruptured eardrum and like yeah. the, the, not even a ruptured eardrum, a completely missing, blown out eardrum. <clears throat> and in Sibby Street, if you lose your eardrum, the procedure is, oh yeah, it'll grow back. But like they don't take into account the fact that he was fucking blown up and his brain started swelling and all this sort of stuff, which caused a lot of problems. Like that's maybe something that maybe um, better addressed if they had like a military specific like um, hospital or something like that, or even just like clinic added on to a hospital. You know, maybe something like that. I don't know. Shit, tons to talk about. Yeah. So when did you turn eighteen, and what was the battalion up to then? Sort of fucking change track. 18, mate. So I was, so I went after I was in the mess, mate. I then joined a different company, Bravo Company, went to Kenya after Christmas, mate. And then I, I went up to the recruiting team for, for six months back up in Vernets. Yeah. Uh, so I turned 18 up there. But done the recruiting for six months, mate. And then we were, I got sent back down to Edinburgh. We'd done, um, the fireman strikes down in Glasgow. Oh, and stuff. That, that was a buzz, mate. Yeah, kind of, little, kind of about in the green goddesses. In those green goddesses, mate. And I remember we were staying in a, a Royal Marine TA centre just down from um, Ibrox. And we were there, the camp beds, mate, in the hall. But uh, I always remember the, fir- the first strike, the, the, the fucking fireman drove past the fire station. I'm fucking sticking their fingers up, mate. And then literally like five minutes after that, we were called out to like a car fire. So I mean, it was as if it was set up. <laughs> but, 
<laughs> but they, they probably set it up making sure it's going to be like completely safe, no one's going to get injured. <laughs> Let's see how but these no, was, respond. <laughs> that, that was a good laugh, mate. Doing that fire and shake. So it's probably like probably up there with one of the, the best things I've done. But um, done the fire and shakes. But during the fire and shakes as well, we were the we were training in between it to go to Bosnia, mate, in two thousand and three. So it kind of got in the way of you know, PDD training. But, um, yeah, no, that was a good laugh, mate. How long were you doing those strikes for? I think it was, it was roughly about four four months, four or five months. Oh, all really? In. Yeah, but they were like on and off. So like sometimes it would just be 24 hour strike. Other times it was like a two-week strike. Right. But, um, yeah, it got, it got quite busy, quite a lot of fires. Uh, more, more than what I thought it would be anyway. Yeah. Is it quite cool yeah, as well? Yeah, yeah, mate, yeah. So the, the only bit of PP that we got given <laughs> was uh, <laughs> <laughs> This is this, mate. Cut, cutting about... Before cutting you about even say flies. a word, I know it's, it's going to be ridiculous. <laughs> we, were, we were told to take our helmet covers off, mate. The, so our dress was like a helmet with a helmet cover off. Full Gore-Tex, mate. <laughs> and a pair of fire, fire retarded gloves. <laughs> that was it, mate. Plastic that, Gore-Tex. Fucking <laughs> fireproof Gore-Tex, mate. Oh, my <laughs> God. Yeah, it's the same every time you see one of these, like, civil interventions. Uh, like, the, the one I see all the fucking time is the flooding, right? And you'll yeah. see fire crews come out, and they're in their dinghy, and they've got a helmet on with a float around their fucking helmet. They've got a fucking big old fucking, they've got a big old dry suit on with floats around their arms, fucking big float in the bit in the middle, all lights and whistles and fucking blow up valves and a parachute on their back, and then a fucking harness on their belt and these waterproof gaiters. And <laughs> you will see some jock pulling the fucking dinghy. <laughs> and he's fucking DPM combat or whatever, headdressing that on slanted. I'm just like, Jesus Christ, give them a fucking, a set of wellies or something. Well, all he's got is fucking seal skin Gore-Tex socks, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I see it all the time. Next time you're watching this, next time, you're, next time you see any flooding, look out for the jocks or the squaddies because they're just wearing regular uniform. Everyone else is pee, -pee up to the utter max. But um, yeah, that's fucking hilarious, mate. The Gore-Tex are doing firefighting. Jesus. <laughs> fucking... <laughs> but yeah, that was a good laugh, mate. That's like a heat shrink. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so you eventually, did you manage to get some good PDT before you went to Bosnia then? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, it, there wasn't much going on in Bosnia at the time, mate. So it was more um, public order training and then like surge training. But yeah, it was, it was quite a good laugh, mate. That was like my first time doing like public order training. Um, yeah, it was really good, mate. I always remember going down to it was Stenta, was it Stenta? Stenta? Stenta, we done it at, mate. I remember like the final fucking riot, we just turned the corner, and it was like big, massive, like orange piles. Like, what the fuck are those? And it was like fucking genetically modified carrots, mate. And these things were like fucking bigger than a baby's arm. <laughs> <laughs> Was getting smashed by carrots, mate. That's how it was. But now it was a good laugh. And I went went to Bosnia over the summertime, so it was quite good. Uh, yeah, Bosnia is quite south in, in terms of like, uh, you know, it's, it's in Europe, but it's closer to the equator than, let's say, like um, Germany or Spain or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Was it, was it quite hot then? Good weather and stuff? Yeah, it was roasty, mate. You know, it was. <laughs> Compared to what it gets to in the winter, I think we were, we were quite lucky with it, the sun. Yeah. Um, yeah, we never really done much, mate. It was more like, so you'd go out in a Land Rover with you and like three guys, and you'd, an interpreter, and you'd just like, drive about and do random searches, mate. Um, just looking for like arms caches and stuff like that. Yeah. But, so I turned 19 out there, mate, and then I done my NCO card right there. Out in Bosnia? Then, yeah, 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 I went to... Oh. Um, Went to some training out there, there, mate. Got thrashed for four weeks, but I picked up. So we finished that, and I picked up like two weeks after it, mate. So I was at a lunch jack, 
I've got a clue what I'm doing. You can't about Bosnia leading patrols, mate. Going out getting fucking drunk. Yeah. <laughs> you used to have one guy in the patrol, mate, and he would be the guy that drinks because it's disrespectful if you turn down the the, the sleevo. You used to call it slipping a ditch. So you would always like say the one guy that you're going to be the fucking the sleevo guy today, mate. Yeah. He would be rolling back in the camp like fucking holding his jock up. Like, you better piss himself. Like, you better you come to it. <laughs> Was that was that hidden truth uh, for the boys out there? Was that um, like sort of fucking protocol? Nah, I don't, it was probably. I wouldn't. Well, I wouldn't say it's hidden truth or protocol. You know, there was like just don't get drunk. Everyone knew it was happening. No one cared about. It. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it was, so we're on like a two can rule, mate. So we're in a place called uh, Sipovo. We we're on like a two can rule, and there was a, a woman that worked in. The bar in the camp, she was like some Russian fucking city, big, tall, like built like a shop party, mate. And you got given this little fucking Russian card with your name on it. And they had like the days of the mumps. And when you went out for a beer, she would like circle, say you had one tin, and then uh, you'd go up again. And what she would do is she would like go around the same circle. Yeah. <laughs> and then when, 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 she, when she thought you had enough, that's when she'd give you like your second can. <laughs> I'm guessing she was profiting off of selling the cans. I think she was, mate. I think she was, like, but no, it was a, it was a good laugh. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, it was a really good laugh, mate. It's probably, like, yeah, looking back now, it's just like, why would you even go out drunk on a patrol, mate? <laughs> it's fucking. <laughs> oh, man, you see some things in the army. Yeah, I always remember, mate, there was, um, we were going out on a, like, a four man patrol down a little look. Like time where we stayed, and in the time there was quite a lot of little cafes um, run by like fucking gangs and mafias that we weren't allowed to go in. So the platoon commander at the time was like, "Yeah, we'll we're, we're going out at fucking one o'clock." So we all thought at one o'clock in the afternoon, rock up for like the G two beef, and they said, "No, it's one in the morning." So like, bonus went back to our fucking little went back to our beds, mate, and then at one o'clock, I'm standing at the auction like. Where the fuck is everyone? Like the boss wasn't there, the other two jocks weren't there. So you fucking yeah, I was just being called off. And then just as I was leaving, mate, they fucking like came around the corner, pissed as a fire, like they'd just been out downtown, mate. <laughs> Ready to go for this patrol. And the the the, the boss was like, hey, Wells, if you just go in and uh, book out through the option for me. I was like, Yeah, no drama, so I booked in through the option. Not thinking at the time, this is fucking this is wrong. We went on patrol, mate. We, we got out of the gate and, like, the fucking. <laughs> the two cars, like, stopped the car and moved the road. So his pistol out and he's like, Where the fuck are you going? Where the fuck? <laughs> I'm like, You fucking hell. And then we walked into these cafes, mate. And then uh, he just walked into one of these out of bounds cafes with his pistol out, with his hands up, like, oh, Let's be fucking having you, you fucking. <laughs> you got all these Serbians, yeah. like, What the fuck? But yeah, that's like, I was like, uh, then I was like, no, this is fucking, like, shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> what the yeah. fuck's going on? Wait, I can imagine yeah, that was... me, my arse would have collapsed and be like, I'm going to jail for a long time. Oh, mate, yeah. <laughs> but stuff like that was happening all the time, mate. Just got swept under the carpet. Not that anyone will find out, like. Like, I don't know much about the, the Highlanders. How was, how was their sort of, like, battalion reputation with the... Would they sort of be known for towing the line or would they be known for sort of being rogues or drama or what? Like, at that nah, time, you say? I think, I think it was like a bit of both, right? I mean, there was, like every battalion, you've got your 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 rogue call signs in it, mate. Like, every battalion's got a crazy cocoa. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but nah, the, it was weird back then, mate, because, like, if you if you look at the jocks now to what it was back then, like there's a hundred percent like massive change. And like now, if like jocks were to go into another jocks room and like fucking I don't know, like fucking jihad him as such, then they they'll just fucking cry me or they'll fucking moan and like grass up on you and stuff like that. But back then, it was like actually encouraged me. Yeah, it was it was more like the the banter was taken well than what it is now. Yeah, <clears throat> that's a it's a good point to bring up because I don't know. I never really got any 
I never got a hazing or anything. What I did yeah. do was get fucking talked to like an absolute piece of shit by my, you know, let's say for instance, when I was on, when I was on my NCO card, right? I rocked, I was, I'll admit, I was maybe before, before I started NCO card, maybe I was too new and too fresh, right? <clears throat> but anyway, I went on the NCO card. And there was boys there that had been in for fucking four years. Private soldiers had been in there for four years. Uh, guys that just came off of the BRF and done, you know, all the pre-deployment training, all of the fucking tour, and been in the recce and all sorts. So I'm rocking up. I've only been in the battalion seven months, and I've done just under a, just under a tour. I mean, which is good enough um, in my books now. Looking back, that's you know, that's plenty to fucking send them. Yeah. But at the time, I'm thinking, oh, fucking hell, I probably should be here. But I'm not going to fucking quit. And I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll just take it. If I fail it, I fail it. Fuck it. At least I'll, I've done the course. So I was just trying my best. And I ended up I ended up messing up loads, like loads. And the guys would fucking let me know I messed up loads. But it's like, it's how you react. Like, if I, yeah. if I was, if I took one of those, one of those instances when I messed up and the guys are calling me a fucking mong or, you know, you're like a fucking idiot or, you know, taking a piss out of me. And I didn't laugh at myself. And I didn't just fucking brush it under the rug. But instead, I fucking wallowed in a, a, self, a pool of self-pity and then went and grasped in them for billion. Like, yeah. what's, who's profiting here? Am I ever going to, am I, am I ever going to raise myself up? Or am I just going to stay at this level where I'm the victim I'm always getting, pers- you know, fucking pers- uh, oppressed by all my fucking peers. Like, if you're that guy who can't laugh at himself and can't pick himself up, then you're not, you're never going to progress. And the, the funny thing is, like, the more you laugh at yourself, the less people are going to haze you, the less people are going to fucking, you know, um, get on your fucking, get on your back about things. And the, yeah. and the more strength that you actually gain from that, like strength is gained, I've always thought, through hardship. And yeah. like getting called a mong by your peers is pretty fucking hard to deal with. Yeah. And it takes a fucking it takes a couple of minutes to, to process. <laughs> I rocked up to the wrong classmate one time and they're like, What the fuck are you doing here, you fucking mong? And you know, it's private soldier, private soldier. I'm like, I didn't even know where I was meant to be. I'm like, I'm, I'm meant to be here. They're like, you you're in the wrong, you're in a different fucking section. I'm like, oh me, like that's something else. Like, where, where am I meant to be, sort of thing. But um, yeah, like I said, like it's how you react to that sort of situations that's that's going to end up making a difference. Yeah, I think uh, like the older you get, like so I, I've certainly realised, right now, you, if you get told to do something, you know it's shit, but you get given a shit job, and you get the people who are like moaning, like fuck, and they go against the grain. I'm not fucking doing it, knowing for well that they are going to end up doing it anyway in the, in the end. You're not going to change the decision. So right now I'm just saying, well, you, you can shimp about it, aye, but it's not going to change the fact that you're still going to do it. You just, just get, get your head down and get on with it. Yeah. <clears throat> Here's another one, right? Just adding on to that point. Right for cleaning on a Friday. Genuinely, <laughs> genuinely, genuinely, there's been times at like 10 a.m. in the morning, right? 10 a.m. They, they bring out a full armory and expect you to clean the full armory before they let you go. Is it not in your benefit just to fucking grind for two hours so you can get let out by lunchtime? You'd be down the road by half twelve. Or you'd be on the road by half twelve. But yeah. in, in t- instead what happens is you get guys moaning and fucking feeling sorry for themselves and then they don't get fed out till five, six, seven at night. It's like yeah. if you just accept the challenge do the fucking shit tasking, you're going to prof. Like, it's the same sort of, same sort of thing as what we just talked about. If you just accept the fucking, the shit talk from your peers, laugh at yourself, you're going to raise yourself up. You're going to yeah. prof. Yeah, 100% mate. Because what they do is, is they sit there, I mean, I know it's shit getting the weapon clean on a Friday, but I shouldn't forget about that until the cows come home, mate. That's the last thing you want to be doing. <laughs> but uh, like like you said, you can either sit there, rub the same fucking gas pipe for like fucking five hours, simply how shit it is, and how you're going to sign off to 
crack it in fucking two hours, mate, and you're down the road before you know it. Yeah. But, like, um, I guess that just comes from maturity, mate. Like, you're never going to tell an 18-year-old. You're never going to convince an 18-year-old, just fucking work hard, get the weapons cleaned, and you'll get you'll, you'll be better off for it. They'll be like, oh, fuck that. <laughs> I'm just going to sit here and pretend to clean this, and somebody else will get the other weapons. And Aye. Everyone's doing the exact same trick, and then nobody's getting their weapons. <laughs> All right, that's fucking right, though, mate. <clears throat> right, so what what were you up to after Bosnia then? Because Iraq kicked off in 2003, and you're obviously in Bosnia. Did did you get any heads up that that was going to be a task for you in the future? Or um, so after Bosnia, mate, we started our move to Germany. Two thousand towards the end of 2003, 2004. So we went to Falun Boston and actually took over from uh, the Black Watch at the time. Uh, took up the role of armoured infantry mate and then it was in as soon as we had done our conversion to that then it was in the in the pipeline to actually go to Iraq 2005 over Christmas time All right. so yeah it was cut sorry go for it go for it yeah sorry cut you off yeah so then I, during that time mate lear, learning how to use a warrior and stuff like that it took us about four months to finish the conversion and you went from Light, light infantry to armour, did you? Yeah, mate, yeah, yeah. <coughs> what, Shock what? to the system. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you probably think, oh, fuck, I never have to tab anywhere again. <laughs> um, and what sort of fucking things did you like? What sort of um, things did you have to like put up with, like, Transitioning from that light infantry to armoured, like, I can't, I can't imagine having to fucking go for it um, and be happy with it. Like just being plain sailing, I know there's going to be some sort of issues. Yeah, it was, it was a nightmare, mate. So it's, you know, for instance, I was like, I end up training to become a gunner, and um, six weeks, mate, in a classroom with this like broken down thirty mil cannon in the classroom, doing skill arms, basically, mate. Learning how to use it and then play, using the simulators, learning how to like the fire control orders. It's a different beast altogether, mate. And then obviously that with that brings all the different tactics you've got to use as well. You've got four big beasts, mate, instead of a fucking a platoon of thirty blokes on their feet. So you've got to learn how to maneuver them, live out the back of them, uh -huh. do do all the certain operations that would be easy on foot, but now you've got to do it with a fucking warrior as well. Yeah. How many blokes do you get in the back of that thing? You can get a section's worth, mate, about seven or eight. All right. Yeah. It's, there, there is room. It's quite tight if you were to get the full eight in, mate. But because of manning and stuff like that, I mean, you're lucky if you've got fucking five in the back. Because the, the, manning, the, the manning gets taken up with a driver, gunner and commander, mate. Yeah. So you just end up with a fire team plus. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> And then um, Iraq 2005, I'm taking it you were armoured on that tour. Yeah, mate, yeah. So I, I joined the tour. So they deployed October 2005, mate. I was on juniors at the time. Um, so I ended up going out towards December time after I finished juniors. Um, so yeah, we were up. So our company, Bravo Company, and our Delta Company, we were up in Alamara, mate, with the Scots DG's battle group. And then the Highlanders battle group were down in Basra, around about the palace and stuff like that. How was it by then? Obviously, 2003 all kicked off and two years later, or how long was it? A year and a half, two years? Yeah, probably, probably sort of two years, yeah, two, yeah. two and a bit years. Um, I mean, it was all right. It wasn't as bad as what it was back in like, the, the war time, but uh, the camp we were in, mate, Camp Abinaji, yeah, that used to get rocketed quite a bit. Um, well, luckily, like none of them hit the camp, but just like the thought of it, mate. You hear the alarm go off, you hear the thuds and the bangs, and you're, you're sitting on like a fucking like a wooden cuddy mate, mate, thinking, "Fucking hell, what's this gonna do?" <laughs> do you know what I mean? But then, like that was probably every night, if not every second night, mate. At least four or five or six rockets at a time coming in, and it, it, it did take its toll because then you've got to 
do the clearance patrols after it is done. You've then got to go out the next day. And with the Scott OSTGs, mate, I mean, nothing against them. They've got a good regiment and stuff like that, but they, they, they done fuck all, mate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Literally. So there, there was that. So there was our two companies up there. And then we had a company of uh, Paris with us as well. I think they were three, para, three or two para, mate, with us as well. And the Scott CGs just like ported about camp, mate. You know, they, they really went out. So they were going out in like uh, their, their Challenger 2s just out into the middle of the desert, mate. Um, yeah, it was fucking... They um, might, they're not meant to be providing you fucking fire support. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but our, I'll just so, take myself out the desert, lads. I'll just take myself out in the desert, right? You just crack on in the city. I'll see you, <laughs> see you after the box finished. Just uh, to toot your horn if you need us, mate. <laughs> Send up a mini for the green, green, green. <laughs> but yeah, so like our our warriors, mate, the, the mileage we put on our tracks and our warriors was fucking quadruple what they put on their tanks, mate. Mm. It's just the workloads just constantly out. So our, our platoon, well, our company... Our eel was round down beside the um, Majar Al Kabir. You know that six RMPs got killed. Um, and it was like a police station, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So in about there, and there was that Danny boy as well, where like the the P Dubs and the Five Scots were there as well. They got quite a hefty contact there. Um, I think that was the first bayonet charge actually was down in that Danny boy mate. I'm sure it was the P Dubs that had done that. Two thousand two thousand Two thousand three, maybe two thousand and four time. Yeah, I'm not um, sure about that. I'll look into it. Yeah, so we were we were down that area, mate, and all the little towns down there. It was quite uh, quite good. And our, our other company, they were actually in Alamara, patrolling around there. You end about like the Simic House and stuff like that. <clears throat> what, sort um, of, what sort of like uh, patrols and stuff were you doing? Were you getting out and out in foot much, or were you just driving through city, or were you? No, yeah, so no, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll take the warriors out, mate, and they'll drop us off in outskirts. We would like patrol in to say we took quite a lot of like civil police advisors to the police stations. So they would like drop us off in outskirts, we'd patrol into the police station, mate, and then the warrior would like meet us, they drop us off, meet us at another pickup point, like on the other side of the little town, and we would like patrol to them and then we'd head back to camp, mate. But um quite a lot of the time, it was quite a lot of Public order for us, I would say. Yeah. Like constantly get constantly getting bricked on patrol, mate. I mean, there was one one time um, we went to the, the police station where we were at was on one side of the river, and directly opposite me there was um, GS Shamadi headquarters. So every time we went in, you could see them obviously dicking us. And as soon as we went over the bridge, mate, we would just get like bricked like, by fucking gangs of like men and stuff. Yeah. It's quite a lot of public order, mate. But um, I mean, it was alright. You know, it was a bit more, a bit more punchier than than Bosnia. So it was still still a buzz going out there. But yeah, so I'd probably say the biggest thing was the getting IDF mate constantly. Yeah, it was constant, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it was. If it wasn't, if it wasn't every night, it was like every second night, mate. And yeah. It was just. But uh, like I said, luckily no, nothing, nothing came in. In the camp, it was there to drop short, it was like fire over the top of us. We were quite lucky in that way. Did the, um, I've not actually asked anyone this that's been to Iraq yet, but did you ever get a chance to cut around the palaces or anything? Um, nah, I mean, the, the guys who were in Alamara probably did, but nah, we didn't really see any of the any of the palaces, mate, to be honest with you. Yeah, but I went down to Bajra Palace. Uh, before I went on R and R, that was that was that was quite something. Like, that's the guys actually lived. Their, their accommodation was in the palace, mate, in the rooms and stuff like that. What was the setup of Bajra Palace? Was it like was it essentially like a camp bastion or? Um, so you had Shaiba logistic base, mate. That was just outside Bajra, so that was more like your bastion right, sort okay. of thing. And um, so Bajra Palace was more like um. I don't know. It was more like what Shawcat was for us on Herrick 15. Right, okay. So more like a, what would they call that, a mob? Yeah, yeah. And you were going there for R&R? &R. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you're like, no, you go there and then 
from there you then like I can go to uh, that Shibal logistic base me and then fly out. Oh right, okay, yeah. So yeah, it was quite. I mean, because you, you hear about it, you hear about Bajra Palace, and then all of a sudden you you're there and you're like fucking, fucking hell. They have um, what are they called SSE shows and all that sort of shit there. So they they did in Shibal logistic base me. The, 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 no, there was a chance for the guys to go down and stuff. And who's that comedian? He's fucking is it Jim Jim Davis. Jim Davidson. Yeah, you know, he he was big on the scene then, mate. With that shows, so he he came out a couple of times. Yeah, he does. Um, he does a bit, I, th- I think for the, you know supporting trips and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, he was quite big, wasn't he? <clears throat> but no, I mean, Iraq was quite good, mate. It was, quite, it was probably it's like the first time I've actually experienced stuff like that. Not not as kinetic as what you would think, but yeah, it was quite um, quite something, mate. Yeah, <clears throat> and obviously you were a screw then, were you? Or did you? No, did you no so I was still still a land shark, mate. No land shark, but land I finished juniors. Just finished juniors, mate. Yeah. Did you get put yeah. in a space commander role, or were you still just a, a land shark? Um, no, nah, so to start off with, when I first went out, um, obviously there was always a fight for who was going to be like the commander on the ground, you know, because you're actually going out patrolling instead of stuck with the warrior. Mm-hmm. So I commanded the warrior for a bit, and then I was I was on the ground as uh, like a fire team commander sort of thing. Yeah. But yeah, no, it was quite good. You feel my, you feel fucking alley kind of about uh, even even if it's four guys following you, you. I feel fucking alley in that first time when it's you that's in charge sort of thing um on patrol on on ops yeah and you're, you're always you're always thinking that it kicks off now i'm gonna fucking you know i've just done juniors keen as fuck i'll get my estimate cards out and stuff and <laughs> stuff like that mate you know what i mean yeah i'm gonna spend time yeah. doing my fucking uh going for my seven questions and then i'm gonna do a set of orders <laughs> um and then I'm going to do a fucking full frontal assault on a position. <laughs> <laughs> and you're you're always like you actually like dreaming off of me to actually go out and do it because when, when I was on juniors, there was guys from um, the, the Paris who had done like tell like one who was P Dubs who were like in a Simic house and just like hearing all their stories, mate. And they're like fucking, hell, I'm actually going to be there in like, a couple of months. I hope, I hope it's like that. But um, like you say, the be careful what you wish for, really, isn't it? Yeah. And at that time, I'm guessing. Well, I'm guessing they they would have been the first guys that had done really anything in what maybe Northern Ireland, but really since the Falklands, they, those boys that you're on juniors would have been the first guys that have done any sort of real shit since the Falklands. Yeah, I, I always remember um, one of the things one of the guys said to me was that he, he was a member of the most exclusive club in the world, mate. And I was like, well, what's no thinking fucking hell is he a Mason? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, nah, the fucking the, the, the front line club. No, he's been on fucking Epstein's <laughs> Island. That's what club he's part of. <laughs> but now he was like, nah, the front line club, mate. The fucking Simic House. Fucking hell. Like, and you actually like envy them. No, you want to be them. You want to be that guy in that fucking YouTube video. Yeah. It's um, it's fucking crazy, like, because um, I've been very fortunate to be, you know, in a lot of combat situations and just solely for the battalion I joined in the jobs that that battalion got given. Yeah. Similar, same, so have you. Um, and, you know, like we said earlier, it doesn't make me any better than anyone else that hasn't had no. that experience. But I do have that experience and it is fucking awesome to own and talk about. Yeah, which is um, which is kind of really why I wanted to fucking start this because there's so many people who've got so much to say, um, and even if you've done the exact same tour as someone else, your perception of that tour is a hundred percent completely different. You know. Yeah, different. Same tour, different stories, mate, isn't it? Even if you were in the same section, you've got a completely different view of that. You know, yeah. the tour that you've done compared to somebody else. So. Yeah, that's my, that's sort of my reasoning behind it. Um, yeah, that's cool that you that you're actually you know finishing juniors and you're straight on tour and you're actually getting a chance, even if it's not you know doing anything of real significance like 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 you said, um, but still getting a chance to actually do stuff on ops and 
was that a good confidence boost for you sort of thing um, starting off um, yeah it was mate definitely 100% um, you know we say that you, you learn your job proper when you're on tour don't you it doesn't matter you can fire all the blanks you want on fucking in break and fighting towards the, the breaking rifles mate some girl could have a poncho up <laughs> <laughs> so then actually like on the ground like doing like actually doing it it's completely different isn't it yeah yeah so that was 2005 um talk me through what was next for you so when so in in germany mate as a it was a bit of a fucking like hand grenade on the drink. Not hand grenades and going out fucking fighting, but finding trouble. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Getting fucking caught. So after after Tell at Seven, mate, there was, a, there was a brigade commander's policy for doing adventure training. All right. We went to. Did you ever go to Austria adventure training? I stayed in that lodge. <laughs> Austria? Yeah, mate. Fucking Alpine. But, Nah, so there's a lodge in Austria, mate. I went uh, to Wales and I went hill walking in Scotland. <laughs> I went, I went hill walking in Wales, and I done canoeing in Wales, and I went hill walking in Scotland. That's it. So summer or winter for? <laughs> <laughs> Scotland. It doesn't matter if it's summer or winter. <laughs> yeah, so we went to. There's a, a lodge in, there's a lodge in Austria, mate. They run like adventure training packages, mate. So it was like the brigade commander's fucking baby that like, everyone had to go and do it. So we went and we done fucking um, kayaking, mate. Like white water fucking kayaking. But in that lodge, there's like, they, they don't mind you drinking, but there's a, a midnight curfew. So obviously you've got to be fit the next day to do, do your activity. So there's one night, mate. Me and one of the boys were like, went out for a couple of drinks and then we like, do you know what, why don't we just like stay out past the fucking curfew? There's like steps going up to the fucking fire exit, so we'll just fucking creep in there. So we went to this fucking club, mate, got a couple of drinks, and then next thing you know, about fucking ten jocks come bursting in. <laughs> we're at the fuck's sake. But they thought it was like a fucking typical German like strip bar, like fucking hoo house. Yeah. And they were just like haranguing the fucking the barmaids, like touching them up and that. No, oh, fucking fifty euros and fucking dance for me. And they ended up they ended up fighting me and like fucking battering the bouncer, like proper like filming them in. So we all get up and like run out of this fucking little club, get captured by the police, mate. Get put in like Austrian fucking prison in the cells, like in the drunk tank. And I always remember like we got released. Uh, they also phoned the adventure training, but. They came and picked us up. We got released, mate. And I remember being in a cell. I was like, in my pants with a fucking itchy blanket. And I remember, I remember, I remember the jocks like walking past the cell, mate, fully clothed. And they're like, "What the fuck are you doing, Wellsy? Where would you get the itchy blanket from?" Like, they took my fucking clothes. <laughs> so I fuck knows why they stripped me. They, they probably fucking fingered me. I don't know, mate, but. The fuck- <laughs> you like uh, were you hammered were you I fucking wasted me yeah. but anyway we went back we ended up getting RTU'd and um, it was Mikey Duffus he was a sergeant major at the time alright and I just remember like sitting in the fucking bus going back like shiting myself like absolutely fucking shiting at me and I went back and I reported to him the next day and he like uh, gave the jocks a burst pulled me into his office well, I'm getting fucking jabbed here. He's just going to, like, fucking jab me. And he gave me a disappointed dad talk, mate. He's like, look, you've just done fucking juniors. You're waiting to pick up. You fucking ruined it. You know, you're a fucking idiot. And then that, that's when it hit, where I was like, fuck, I could actually, like, waste everything I've just done. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that was, like, on the Tuesday, mate. Come Friday, he called me to his office. He's like, we need to get you away out of here while this investigation goes on, because the jocks actually, like, done the bouncer in big time. Like, right. Fucking hammered him. So, uh, he's like, I'm sending you away on Sunday. Fucking pack your bags. He's like, where am I going, sir? He's like, you're going to Canada for a fucking, I think it was, like, seven, eight weeks to do rain safety. We need to get you, like, un- like under the radar. 
So I went to Canada, mate, done like rain safety out there. But then by the time when I got back, so I like landed on the fucking, landed on the Sunday night, there was like some cunt living in my room, mate. Like all my kit was, all my kit was gone. Some fucking cunt living in my room. I was like, what the fuck's going on here? And they're like, oh, well, so you're posted. I was like, what do you mean I'm posted? That like, you're going to, you're going to Catholic. Like, since when? Like, so it's been like weeks. It's like, we've, everyone's doing that's how I'm in your room. So I kept on his floor, mate, and I went and seen uh, Mickey Duffus the next day, and he's like, yeah, get your clean shit signed. You're fucking, you're getting promoted to screw, and you're going to Catholic on the Friday. Fucking book yourself out, mate. So yeah, I rocked up to Catholic on, on the Monday, me and one of the other Hellman boys, still Lance Jacks, full screw tapes in our pockets, like, well, do, do we wear these? Do we, what, are we, like, full screws now? Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck's going on? <laughs> you know, promoted, promoted each other. Yeah, there you go, mate. Well done. <laughs> and yeah, and then I've had two years at Catholic, mate. But um, my first couple of months in Catholic was more like SIB interviews and stuff like that. And then never, never heard anything. Never heard anything about what happened spent, since, mate. I spent the first my first year uh, getting myself on murder charges instead of training jobs. <laughs> totally legit. <laughs> the damn it is then I went to Catholic so I think because uh, you know people like that they, they've, they've probably done worse in their time mate right. and they're just trying to look out look out for you so yeah I was quite quite lucky that way but I think that happened at a good time mate because if I stayed in Germany acting the way I was acting like a fucking nugget on the drink then it could have got a lot worse yeah <clears throat> I mean, I experienced the same thing with fucking the the RSM fucking un, un, uh, or sad dad talk, and I'm like, you know, you walk out those that room, and you're just like, oh mate, that's worse than like anything they could have gave you. You're just like, fuck, yeah. like I'm a fucking waster sort of thing. But like I said, hardship makes you stronger. Then you try and fix yourself, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you end up in worse yeah. positions. But um, yeah, that that's that. Um, so how how did you get on at Catrick? Did you enjoy yourself down there, or was it something that maybe sounded gleaming at the time, but turned into something different? What was your experience? No, nah, I mean it's probably the same when I came here, mate. So I, I enjoy it because you, you're on a program, you know what you're on. There's uh, you know security off. I'm on this course for twenty four weeks. After this twenty four weeks, I'm. I'm going to get leave. I'm getting leave in between. This is my leave dates. And, you know, you you go to Catrick knowing that you you put a graft in, but your time off is your time off. Mm-hmm. You're not dealing with any of the, the bullshit in battalion. But no, I enjoyed it, mate. I enjoyed, like, it was good because you, you get some fucking Ned coming, like, day one, week one. And then seeing him pass out at the end of that 24 weeks, mate, like a better person. Yeah joining like gonna probably have a good career it's yeah. quite rewarding yeah um, but no i enjoyed it <clears throat> no no grievances mate it was, it was quite good i mean and you get some you 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 bounce off the other instructors as well and you pick up stuff from them i mean quite so quite a lot of them have been section commanders in battalion for the two years and then got posted. So the no experience as um, as a session commander. Whereas I was just a fucking I was a lance jack on a Sunday and then one day promoted myself to full screw. <laughs> I had no proper experience of like how to be a section commander and stuff like that. Yeah. I think uh, I think for guys doing that <clears throat> it's um the best thing I think that guys would, would take away from being at depot is the fact that you come away from there having a a level of understanding of just almost just general general overall topics uh, that you're teaching week in week out and you're teaching them four or five times while you're down there. You end up becoming a, an SME of basically your role, basically yeah. infantry um, weapons, basically infantry tactics infantry procedure all that sort of stuff you just become an sme of it just because you've yeah. been over and over and over it and the you know the repetitions that you take uh that you go through you know ingrain it each time you do it it gets a little more ingrained and by the time you come back to battalion you, you, you know it's, it's 
but it's second nature or whatever. You know the yeah. sort of shit, the basic shit that you need to know as a as an infantry screw on the back, like the back of your hand, sort of thing. So that's, yeah. I mean, I never went to depot as a screw, but um, like that's my understanding of how how useful it could be for somebody who is down there in their career and yeah. in their per- own personal development as well. <clears throat> um, how was uh, how was it going back to battalion after after Catrick then? Did you um, slide back in into a section and you know take over a section or what 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 sort of role were you doing next? Well, so that that's when I transferred to three Scots, mate. Right. Okay. So when I was in, when I was in Catrick, um, the Highlanders were on Herrick Eight, and I, I tried to get released early to go on tour. Um, couldn't go, and then the the thought of like going back there, not done in like a combat tour like what they've just done, you know, not knowing when you'll get the experience to do it again, kind of got to me a wee bit. But also, you know, the, the like the Highlanders see when I at the time came over and like, look, what what do I do when you go back? Is it well, what do you see in your reckon? Like, well, because you're young, you know, we'll we'll put you back, and you can do like what are your DMI learn like how to fucking teach people how to drive the warrior and you become a warrior sergeant and then we will look at putting you on seniors and I was like nah, I don't really want that because you know, that would be me trapped because they're, they're not going to send someone away who's qualified in that role to then go and do a different fucking job mm. so um, we Tommy Brady was on my training team at the time and he's like yeah look, three Scots are going to um, Afghan 2009 like summertime should transfer over and then he told me they were like moving to Inverness. So that would be ideal for me, mate, coming from the fucking Schneck. So yeah, I transferred over, mate. And then it was a weird one. So like uh, I was still in Catrick. Catrick released me to go and do the pre deployment training. Um, I'd done that. And then I went back to Catrick, mate, done my handover. And then I was only in the fort for probably six weeks, six, seven weeks. And then straight out on tour, mate. So, it was quite um, good. so you you uh, you went straight from Catterick to the battalion and done six weeks sort of pre deployment training. Yeah, and then I then I went back to Catterick to like do my handover, right. and then back back to free scores, mate. But bit of a weird one, is it not? Yeah, I mean, so I think uh, I think at the time. Three Scots knew they were going to be on quite a punchy tour. And if I missed the pre-deployment training, I wouldn't have went from the start sort of thing. Right, okay. And it also gave me a chance to meet the guys and get embedded with like the platoon I was joining and whatnot. Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was quite good. Yeah. So post uh, Catrick then, you you join uh, Three Scots and you're, you're obviously a such commander um, in Alpha Company? No, Bravo Company, six platoon mate. Oh fuck, that's right. Yeah. Um, how was that? Um, it was kind of a weird one, mate. So I, I don't know if uh, Mr. Hal they talked about it, but the dynamics of the platoon that he had, there was quite a lot of pushback from the um, section commanders that he had there. So there was me and there was someone else, and then there was a uh, Lance Jack um, as the other section commander, and then. The the full school didn't go on with Mr. Halliday at all. Like they they clashed, mate. But in the same way that full school was also friends with fucking Fumez at the time, and then they clashed. So like there was like Fumez in the section commander, and then they didn't go on with Mr. Halliday. And I'm in there thinking this is fucking weird, mate. Like I don't know anyone from yeah. I, I didn't know anyone at the time, and I'm I'm like noticing this. You know, it was like really bad, mate. It was like a toxic environment sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, so I was just link. I was. I was stop you there and just linking that the second episode of the podcast that I've, I've done is with the platoon commander that you're you're referencing there, Mister Halliday. Yeah. Um. You know, so if you want to go and listen to what his story is, um, you can go and fucking listen to that. But that's a that's a, re- a weird one there uh, because, um, it's kind of unusual to to have. 
you know, sets commanders and platoon sergeant. I mean, it's not unusual, really, is it? It's, but it's you know, it's definitely frowned upon. Like everyone should know their place. That's what's unusual. Yeah. It's not unusual yeah. for sets commanders and uh, platoon sergeant to have a friendship. But what is unusual is to not know their place. Um, yeah. I'm not. I'm not saying that they were out of place. I'm just saying what you're saying is that it. there was a, a rift sort of thing. Yeah, I think it was more that personality sort of clash. Yeah, and um, I mean, as soon as I went there, the, I I got on well with Mister Haldy. Like we we hit off quite well. I think because as well as like more of the, I had the experience of being a catnick and then a, a dumb tours before. That you know we we just got on like like a house on fire, mate. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but then that that sort of changed. So that when we actually deployed, um, that section quad removed the uh, platoon mate. And we got fucking Dunky Bruce, so it was, it was loads better. Um, but yeah, so I think, so obviously that up where them um, few men got shot, I think if we if we didn't get Danny Buist um, stepping up, I think it would have been quite a, lot, quite a different tour for us with the way that the dynamics of the platoon were going. Right, okay, yeah. <laughs> and so what, what happened with, with few men getting shot? That's a platoon sergeant. Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> I shouldn't laugh here because it's like the, it's like the, the funniest. It's probably like one of the funniest things I've like seen, like, in in like a in like a squally sixth sense of humour way. Yeah. So we're going into an ops box called Ops Box Dingle. In the BRF, we're bouncing about and they were doing like recce with fire, and we actually it was like the the first big contact from B Company. So we went in, and I remember me and um, do you remember we Courtsy? Mm-hmm. We met of course. So he was um, he was in my section mate. So he was the Valen man. I remember Valen into this compound. We went into and the walls were only like waist high. Went took fire positions up against the wall. Um, old Duke, he was in my section as well. And we're just on the wall. We've seen all the locals like leave out the area as you do. You know, you're like, fucking hell, right, here we go. Right, is it real when the locals leave, it's going to kick off? And then, funny enough, it did kick off, mate. So we're all in the compound. And then the contact stopped and it'll start again. It was just throughout the day. I remember we, we Blakey, we Shaky Blakey. So he was a sharpshooter at the time, mate. And he was up on the roof. And he managed to fucking, he shot like one of the gunmen. And he was like lying dead on the roof. And he's like, oh, I fucking got him. And obviously everyone was wanting to go up and have a look for the scope to, <laughs> uh, to, have, to have a look at it, mate. <laughs> but, uh, get that, get that <laughs> killed. But uh, yeah, so I always remember Fumez going up the roof to have a look. And we got contacted again. And I swear it was a ricochet because you heard it like hit the wall and then like ping away. We fought nothing off it. No, we all took cover. And then a few minutes came around the corner, mate, holding his arm, like, ah, I've, I've been shot. Ah. And then, like, put himself in the recovery position. <laughs> but, he, <laughs> but he didn't get on well with, um, remember Willie Yemen? Yeah. So he, he didn't get on well with him. Um, and he was a team medic. And Willie Emmons like, running over, you know, trying to fucking sort him out. And he was going to give him morphine. And he said, no, get the fuck away from me. I don't want fucking morphine. Fuck off. You know, I don't want him near me. Fucking Mongo. <laughs> and Willie, Willie Emmons was just like, okay, sign me. And then went, went to leave and he's like, give me the morphine. So he's okay, fucking give me the morphine. <laughs> it was just funny, mate, because you're like, fuck yeah, he's, he's like, this is our first contact. He's like, the platoon sergeant's been shot. He's like put himself in the recovery position. <laughs> but yeah, you know, but l- lucky enough, it wasn't like, you know, still a serious injury, but not as serious as what it could have been. And he, he like survived it and stuff like that. But yeah, and then that's when Danny Beers took over the platoon, mate. So he was FSG, one of the FSG sergeants at the time. And he was attached to us with a jab debt. And yeah, he, Stayed with the platoon mate, and like him and Mister Halliday, they they were like brothers, mate. You know, they were like, inseparable, and yeah. you know they, they got on really well, and you know it showed in the platoon mate the, the amount of respect the platoon has, and 
the, the guys like still do have for Mr. Halliday and Danny Beers for me, it's unreal. They like, couldn't yeah. ask for any better guys to like, take over the platoon. Brilliant. So it was quite good, mate. Did he take over on that up or did it did it happen after or not? Did someone step up and put in sergeant or did he No, he, he stepped up straight away, mate. Right. So um we when once a few minutes got Kazi back, we went into like a like a desert hide sort of thing. And yeah, Danny I don't think he was meant to stay with us for the the, the duration. It was just probably meant to be for the op. But yeah, he ended up staying with us for the duration, mate. Which is quite good. Because then he he's he was close friends with um, Craigie Weir and Rabbi Creed as well. So, you know, if they get on, everyone gets on. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that was quite good, mate. Oh, that's class. Um, did you enjoy that that sort of fucking um, pace, of, pace of ops and the two that we had uh, back in 2009? Fucking loved it, mate. It was probably, I remember speaking to Glenn Simpson couple of years ago we were like messaging each other mate and we were like fucking spinning bits about the uh, one of the sangin ops we done and i just remember like saying to him like we'll never be that cool again like never <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's true yeah. there'll, there'll never be another rock like it mate i've already i've already resigned myself to the fact that i'll never be that cool again the fact that when yeah. i was 18 years old for fuck's sake but um it's, it's just the it's hard to explain to people, mate, what it's actually like. Yeah. And when you tell them, when you tell them stories, like people have never been away on tour before, when you tell them stories, they look at you as if they think, "Are you like exaggerating what you're telling me?" And you're like, "No, this is like proper gen, like what it was like." The big thing that the big thing is, I think, is why we never took as many casualties is because we couldn't do like full platoon company attacks, and it's it's kind of. It's kind of weird if you, you know, if you, let's say you've not been to Afghan and let, you don't know why you can't do that, but as an infantry company, infantry rifle platoon or company, you cannot do a full company or a full platoon or even a fucking full section attack in Afghan um, at that time. Just because the fucking IEDs are everywhere. Everywhere you move has to be fucking checked and, you know, you know, if there's any sort of anomaly, it needs to either be diverted or, you know, fucking checked um, by a metal detector and fucking exposed what's underneath there before you can actually make a move. So to do a full platoon attack and, you know, you've got guys running all over the place, left, right, centre, at pace with fucking momentum, like, it just can't happen. Like, it's meant to happen. Yeah. Um so I think that's maybe why we didn't take as many casualties and like in general, like Afghan, we didn't, you never took as many casualties like let's say the Falklands or even fucking World, uh, World War Wars did. Uh, World War Wars. World <laughs> Wars. <laughs> Fuck me, what the hell is that saying? But um, yeah, like you come into contact and you, you know, you everything's every single thing's different to what you've been taught. Yeah, yeah. Um, 100%. Yeah, how how so you were section commander there, like obviously you're in contact every single day pretty much. Um what was your experiences being a, a screw at that time? Like because that's that's what you fucking joined for. That's your pinnacle. Yeah, I mean uh, I remember one of the, the standing ops we done, mate. It was a twenty four hours. Um we had like the SPS with us as well, no, because we were doing like narcotics raids with them. So I remember um, six platoon. We so we, if it was like Helmand Ops, we'd fly from Bashi Moon. We, and if it was in Kandahar and Harry Diamonds, we'd fly from Kandahar. But for this Sangin Op, because of the lack of British helicopters, we flew from Kandahar and I think it was Canadian Chinooks, mate. So because of the the flight time from calf to Stangen. So everyone was on the ground at the same time. Uh, we flew to like a like a desert leaguer just short of Stangen mm-hmm. as a platoon. And then the Chinooks came back, picked up the rest of the company. They went in and landed. And then they came and picked us up. I remember when they came to pick us up, mate, um, there was like loads of fucking empty cases on the floor. There was like a belt 762 on the floor. 
And like me and Dunky Bruce used to always like sit at the front so like the first off. I remember picking up the belt of fucking seven six two, like tapping Dunky on the leg, being like, "Fucking some mongos dropped the fucking link," and he's out oh, for fuck's sake. And I remember the tail gunner on the Chinook like coming past, like fucking grabbing out my hand. He's like, "Hey man, that's fucking mine. We're gonna need it, but we're going." Uh, fucking hell, on about? I had not a clue what he was on about. Just like totally like he's just fucking snatched that link out of my hand for no reason. But then you look on the floor and there's like brass all over the floor and I think fucking hell, what's like going on here? So as we fly in the sang and me, obviously the Chinooks fucking drop down, fly like almost skimming the fucking rooftops of the compounds. And everything just lit up, mate. Green tracer flying everywhere, the door gunners are fucking firing. The SBS guy we had on with us, his name was Screwy, mate. He was sitting on the, the back tailgate with his fucking M4, fucking shooting his M4 out the back. <laughs> I just remember looking at Dunkey, mate. <laughs> I remember looking at Dunkey thinking, what the fuck's going on here? And we landed, mate, and I always described it as like something at the Saving Private Ryan, you know, like the first fucking, the first scenes of Saving Private Ryan where they jump yeah. off the, the boat. I'm just running into the darkness, mate, with tracer pinging everywhere. The the mini guns firing off the Chinook, mate, and it's like pitch black apart from all these fucking rockets getting fired. And then the Chinooks take off and it's like silence, mate. And it's, I always remember that silence. You know, when the first time the Chinooks like fly away, mm-hmm. it's like the loneliest you'll ever feel. But I've never experienced like loneliness like it, mate. You're out there and you're just like, you're not by yourself, but you know, you're with everyone else and you're in the same sort of shit together. Well, yeah, um, it's um, it's such a fucking weird feeling because obviously this is a, this is a Afghanistan. Like like yeah. I said, I didn't even know there was a country called Afghanistan before I got there. And now you're landing in this place called Sangin, never been there before. You have no idea about how big the country is, how, you know, you know what the buildings are like. You get off and it's just like, right, you look around like I can see mountains fucking in the distance. I'm looking, I can see a couple of compounds. It's like I have no idea where the fuck I am. I don't have a map, like that's out my hands. Like you just in a fine position looking into a fucking into like a pathway or a, a hedge or like a not a hedge, a field or um like at a compound or something like that. You're just thinking, yeah. like this is all I need to do right now is just cover my heart. It's like you fucking you have no idea about the depth of what's actually going on around you at the time. That's like coming from a fucking a joke, but nah. So I, I remember, mate. We, we went into our target compound first with the, the SBS guy and his like. Um, what were the there were Tiger teams running the Afghan SF? Yeah, the Tiger teams. I think they had. So a, had like, I think they had an FSSG, uh, SFSG guy attached as like the search commander type type dude. Or yeah, like mentor or whatever. So we went into the compound. We found like locals, the um, opium presses and stuff like that. So the SPS dude's fucking um, screwy. He he left his day sack on the Chinook mate. So all he had on him was his fucking rifle, his like, plate carrier, no water, no foods, no ammo. He just fucking left it on. But he blew up the press. And I remember Mr. Halliday being like, "Okay, well, you take your section." Over the open ground, mate, we'll head, like, hit the tree line and then we'll go head, meet up with the company. And I remember, mate, like, stepping out to that open ground, it was like, probably about 100 metres into it. And then just the fucking ground erupting, mate, with like fucking rounds buzzing about us. And obviously, we've been in contact before, but it was like, you're behind a compound wall, mate. You feel invisible behind that wall, but I'm stuck in the open now. Fucking digging in with my eyelids. You know, I've got half my section stuck in the open. The rest of the platoon's on a bun line in cover. And I'm like, fucking hell. Like, going back to what you were saying about like, being a section commander. Like, trying to, like, build up the courage to actually, like, do your, your job. You no, know, without, like, worrying, like, if I stick my head up now, I'm going to get shot. Just, like, having that courage to, like, actually command. You know, it was quite... Cause, You've got you're scared, but you've got to show the jocks that you're not scared. Because mm-hmm. then, do you know what I mean? So you put on an act for them. But I remember we we got the fire position, mate. It took us about fucking two minutes to find it, and I'd carried the sixty six like for the last couple of ops. Never fired it, thinking fuck it, I'm going to fire this. 
I remember like getting on my knee, clipping off my fucking camelback, mate. And I always remember like Danny telling us, if you're going to fire it, like aim low, always aim low, because then like the round fucking, because he's like a javelin guru, so he was like talking about the round like, trajectory and stuff. Yeah. I remember seeing the firing point in the roof, mate, and just like firing a 66. Like, not a clue what I was doing, reading the instructions off the fucking tube, mate. <laughs> no, the way, no, the reading the instructions in the middle of contact. <laughs> what? You got it back to front, you're like, right, fucking hell, flip it round. Yeah. <laughs> right, looking at it, like, what's he doing? Right, okay, fucking. <laughs> I remember firing at me and getting that firing point and like the contact stopping and thinking, fucking hell. Like, that's like, like seeing an explosion, like I've just caused that explosion, like stop on the firing point, like stop the fire. Peeled back into to cover, and I remember Mr. Hardy being like, right, Wellsy, if you get your section now and like head down that way. And I remember just looking at him thinking, I've just been like stuck in the open with my guys. <laughs> get yeah. another section to go. But <laughs> like, so that was that was my thinking at the time. But see now, the more I think about it, he had obviously done that to keep me busy. So I, w- I wouldn't think about like what had just happened. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, we got hit again going back down that way. And we were stuck in that compound for like, most of the day. But even then, when we came out the compound, mate, he was like, right, well, see, we're just going to gonna head over that way now. And then just getting the job, just being like, look, lads, we need to go out in open ground now to the next compound. We've got about 150, 200 metres to go, let's go. And then going for it. But then, Let's see, fucking 50 metres in the open ground, mate, contacted again. Like, it must have happened about four times in that one day, mate. I swear I had like a big sign like, saying, fucking shoot, shoot here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just like building up that courage, mate. You know it's going to happen. Like, it's, it's not going away. And just like building the courage, getting the guys like built up, G'd up for it, mate, and then just actually stepping out into the open ground again. It's, you know, it's not easy, but if you've got a job to do, haven't you? you've just got to crack mm-hmm. on with it. Like, knowing it's going to happen, is, um, I'll relate back to um, what he did that. Every morning, every night, dusk and dawn, we'd have fucking mad, a mad half hour or a mad hour of you know, enemy, enemy attack, essentially. Sometimes yeah. it's just, you know, they'd, they'd shoot us for a fucking half hour. Sometimes it, they, they would try and attack on the actual fucking... Uh, on the PB, um, but yeah, like, like we all, like we knew it was coming so much so that we got the whole company stood to, good to go, full kit on, you know, weapons prepped, and then as soon as it happened, when we were all up in the walls and we we're all good to go to react, like, it's almost like sometimes it's like you can time it, and then yeah. just that you can time it when it's not going to happen, like in the midday heat, you know, you're not going to get contacted in the the peak hours, like you're not going to be well, you can bet your bum dolly you're not going to be fucking uh, fighting in the midday heat. It's going to be between early hours in the morning when it's uh, when it's light and, and cool up until it starts to get too hot and too uncomfortable to fucking operate, let's say, like, half 10, 11. And then you have that pause until, like, no, no, maybe three, something like that, and then just carry on. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's, like you said, it's predictable and, you know... Um, it's just how you how you best deal with it. If you, you know, try and be as prepared as you can. Try and you know anticipate you know where you're going to move to, um, anticipate ac- actions on and stuff like that. But you know, if you go all that squared away, then you you, sh- you should have the courage, like, and you should have the confidence that no matter what what goes down, like you you'd be squared away, and yeah, you know, uh, you'd be able to fucking react to what what's going on. Um, yeah, talk more about some other ops that you. you that you done in into 2009 because um, I know you obviously done fucking an absolute shit ton. Can you mem- remember any that stuck out for you as being pretty cool for just whatever whatever reason? I remember. I think you talked about it as well when we were in the height of darkness, mate, and we landed in that fucking minefield. Yeah, the the, the free body systems and like like you said, mate. I remember walking. You're like. You're walk, you, you see all the, the rockets firing, the fucking Apaches are giving it big licks. And you're walking towards that, mate. Like you are, <laughs> you're walking into that and you're like, what the fuck's going on here? And there's, yeah. you know, like any, any other person would run, but we're actually like walking towards it, mate. 
I always thing, remember the high the, bangers. The thing about that, like uh, I think I failed to mention it last time, that where we were, it was eerily quiet. But yeah. where everything was going on was like an absolute fucking, ex- just constant explosion is all I could you know, describe it as. And it was about, I don't know, maybe two or three k's away. And like, that take you maybe an hour to get there or something like that. I don't know. Maybe less than two k's. Maybe about, yeah, maybe about two k's. But it would take you about an hour to get there. Um, and so you're walking towards it. And like, as you get closer, it's getting louder and louder and louder. And there's more and more rockets and more and more fucking 30 mil cannon getting blasted. And you're like, fucking hell. Yeah. Here we go. Um but yeah, like as we actually got close to it, it's you know, I guess Apache's fucking <laughs> they fucking zapped every cunt. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the video from that? Yeah, I remember seeing it, mate, and just like seeing the the Chinooks landing, and then like a fucking battalion of Taliban like running from one compound, mate, like literally next door to it. Yeah, the video's on YouTube. Uh, I'll probably try and get it in the dis- uh, in the description below. Uh, but yeah, like the first couple of seconds, of like maybe 20 seconds of that video shows like uh, the guys landing, uh, Alpha Company landing in the, in the fields. And then 20 seconds later, you got, like you said, a full company of fucking Taliban running about, like spreading out all and trying to go to their stand to positions and, you know, organized. They're not, it's not as yeah. if they're just all running in the one direction, running away. They're all organized and they're all moving in groups of two and three and they're all going to their pre pre uh, deposed positions. Um, but yeah, that, the Apaches, mate, they just fucking tear those cunts up, mate, in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't remember what op it was, mate. I don't know if it was. Remember, we done that uh, the Twenty Forever one after I don't know. We literally just went in, got shot at, stayed still, and then like bugged out. Um, I, you know, you maybe need to give me a bit more description. I, they all merged. So, for me, my memory's terrible, and they all can emerge into one. Yeah, so I remember coming back from Iron Army and uh, we'd done this, it was at a 24 hour up in Kandahar. And I remember it was just, uh, it was basically a recce by fire just to see if anyone was there. And we got contacted. Once we got contacted, the OST was like, well, that's like, it's complete. We're, we're bugging out in the morning. And I'm not sure if it was that one where the, the I star picked up the Taliban going to ambush the, the HLS. Do you mind that? We had to like oh, move to another HLS. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the Taliban were fucking making monkey noises, mate. <laughs> I remember oh, sitting yeah. in the, in the we, I remember uh, sitting in the dark, mate, with the fucking Taliban like fucking making all these animal noises, like shitting my pants, thinking they've they're ambushing us again. But it's fucking yeah. mental. I remember having like so I was part of the uh, the company search section, so it was our job to like clear all the HLSs and stuff like that. Uh, I remember going out in one of these HLS uh, HLS clearing tasks, and um, you know, like all the companies behind me, and I'm like walking out into this open field with my valen, like clearing the fucking this this basically a fucking field, a full field. I'm clearing a full field <laughs> with me and another bloke with a valen, um, and like. All I've been told all day long is that they've got eyes on, they've got eyes on, they've got eyes on, like, and then it gets dark and it's like, yeah, they've got eyes on, they're going to attack, they've got eyes on, they're going to attack. And like, I'm now going out here on my own, the full company sitting in a compound behind me, and it's me and two of the guys, they we're clearing like six HLSs, and I'm fucking, I'm looking at the ground, looking at the fucking, the, the lights on my valley, and I'm, I'm like, if I don't look up here, I'm going to get fucking waxed. Somebody's going to come, come out and fucking, uh, slip my throat or something like that but yeah um the shit that runs through your head is fucking it's it's crazy but funny at the same time like you know like that that paranoia but at the same time you're like yeah i'm fucking i'm i'm good i'm good i'm good you keep telling yourself you're good you're good you're good Uh, (laughs) but yeah it was was funny um i remember doing that on the 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 dwyer up we cleared all the hlss and it was like yeah, Rolex 24 hours. It took us about two hours to clear like the six HLSs. And it was like, yeah, uh, I just finished clearing the last one. It's like, yeah, we're going to Rolex 24 hours. Um, so then all that work I'd just done was for fuck all. <laughs> we went back to yeah, the I remember that all. <laughs> we went back to the compounds. We got told we were getting picked up the next day. Fuming. <laughs> After my tits in for two hours. I remember landing in Fog Dwyer, mate, and... Uh... 
we just went in. It was the, that big fucking tent, so right? no air conditioning and covered in sand. <laughs> and I remember, like, we were only there for like ten minutes. Nobody had even left the tent. And I remember, like, the, the IQ like coming in. I think it was uh, Houston, the, the wee guy with the moustache. I remember him like coming in, like giving us a burst because somebody had broken the fucking the uh, hero, Star in hero. The American, the, the Americans' welfare suite. <laughs> and he's like, he's an all fucking band. So we've not even been in it. Fuck's sake. <laughs> yeah, the sub- the the um the sandwich place as well raided everything in their fucking sandwich yeah. place. It was like an honesty thing as well. It was like you go in there, you maybe just make a wee sandwich and like it's like you know help yourself. <laughs> And then you've got a full, a full company of guys just going in there raiding every single thing from every single jar, all the drinks, <laughs> all the Gatorade sachets, everything, mate. We're like, what the fuck? Gatorade sachets? Like, fucking as, a Brit, as a Brit, you're looking at that thinking, that's fucking gold dust. Yeah. You don't get fucking banned. You get banned. I know you're banned, yeah. Stay in your fucking tent and don't come out. Fucking animals. I know, that looks fucking hilarious. <laughs> That place was an absolute shithole, though. Like the, yeah. the, so you got, I don't even know what you call it. Is it magic dust or something like that? I can't remember, but it was basically like talcum powder sand. Yeah. Um, and you literally just walk in and your feet would just disappear up to like mid shin of just fucking deep talcum powder texture, like, like sand. It was fucking weird. And that sand would get fucking everywhere. Dusty as fuck. That was a horrible place, mate. Yeah, we were just a fucking target. Well, they built a fob for that fob, weren't we? We had a distraction. Yeah, I think so. And uh, we were clearing. They were clearing a bazaar. Well, we cle- yeah. we ended up clearing a bazaar. Don't know if that was just for shits and gigs, but um, well, that's that's what the uh, I think the main effort was at the time to clear this bazaar, make sure it was fucking. You know, they're not hiding any weapons or ID components and all that sort of stuff. We did find a few wee bits and bobs, but, you know, no big caches or that like we were promised. Um, I've got a fucking gleaming story about that. Because remember how we, we got there? We flew there on a, a C-130. Um, and then on our rock, because we were so far south, like they were like, oh, yeah, we're not going to be using any any of our airframes. We're going to have to use the what the Marines have got. We're like, yeah, oh, the fucking sea stallions. Like, companies like, yeah, no problem, blah, blah, blah. So then anyway, we were like, I remember sitting in a truck, like not even knowing what I'm going into. And yeah, they're like, oh yeah, like line up in your trucks. And we were stood there. I was like, well, what fucking direction are we going in? Like, what, like, what's the seat in order? Like, who's, who's going where? Like, you don't have a clue. <laughs> um, so anyway, we jump in these things that, and they, I can't remember. They looked like Merlins, but they were old as fuck. What were they? Do you know? I think it was the Sea Stallions. I have no idea. But they, they were old anyway. They were old. They yeah. Were old. But, and uh, so my platoon, we, we all got, we got the platoon in one. And uh, taking off, mate, and it's, it's gone, it's taking off and it's making some sh- fucking scary sounds like, you know, like it's, <laughs> like the engine's about to cut out. Yeah, it's like, and it's taking off, it's going, <laughs> and going down. <laughs> it's going, and it's going down and it's going I'm sitting in my seat like fuck 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 this thing's going to drop at the sky it's going and it's doing that for about five minutes mate and all of a sudden it's going all of a sudden mate I'm like fuck fuck sitting in there in the pitch dark inside this helicopter mate and I'm like what the fuck was that in my head I'm like what the fuck was that what the fuck was looking left and right you couldn't see anything mate (laughs) we'd get off mate and uh all, obviously, fucking the brown out settles and the, all the all the the noise disappears and it's just stone cold silence. And then we've got one guy just like fucking hell, fuck, fuck's sake, fucking hell. And uh, so I like listen, I like kind of you know, under prone face of my arcs. So I'm listening in, and <laughs> kind of looking over my shoulder, like what the fuck's going on? What's going on? Anyway, like as that helicopter struggling for dear life, apparently an oil fucking hose had exploded, like off the side, <laughs> off the inside of the the helicopter, and uh, fucking covered one of the lads uh, in uh, in oil, and like I'm talking head to toe in oil, like uh, fucking I don't even know what like, hydraulic oil or whatever, 
and Sammy gets off me and the brown it's there and he's then so then the brown it just covers him in fucking dirt and dust and sand mate and he's in shit state for the next fucking three four days like just covered filthy as fuck is that not uh, Scotty Mackey? yeah 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 and then on the very same op when we were doing the when we were doing our post uh, post op fucking reorg and you know reassemble uh <laughs> After we were getting transported from the air, from the airhead back to camp in a like a four tonner, and as he was coming down on on the uh, coming down the ladder on the back of the four tonner on the tailgate, he fucking missed missed a step, mate, and fell back on his day sack, <laughs> mate. And he had the the yellow marker paint in his day sack. The fucking tin exploded, mate, and covered every single bit of kit that was in his day sack. Viper. <laughs> Oh, all his ammo, <laughs> every bit of kit that he had in there, mate, it was covered in yellow paint, mate. And then there's yellow paint on the outside his day sack and up his neck, and he's covered in fucking all this oil and dirt from the past three, four days, mate. <laughs> I remember him just being completely fucking snapped. Everyone's <laughs> laughing at him, like, way. <laughs> you know, it happened to a better guy, he took it well. <laughs> That's fucking cool, eh? Yeah. <laughs> It, it, it was real to me. That it's kind of surreal, like because uh, it was literally you'd go around and you just fucking you'd wing somebody your your grenade and you you'd hand the fucking uh I, you know like a damaged um, grenade in and you just somebody would just give you a fucking fresh one and then you'd hand, you'd go and see about getting an extra two white forces and it's just like help yourself to everything you need to like rejig your kit up and it's like yeah. fucking hell man Jesus Christ I get whatever the fuck I want here. <laughs> <laughs> guys, I know. I, I remember, guys, what they were doing was uh, like UGL gunners. They were handing in their um, what was it? There, they were. So you get red and white force, don't you? Yeah. And what they were doing is they were obviously they'd fire red force on patrol, and then when they were doing the reorg, they would pick up more white force. So it ended up they were going to patrol, and all they had was just white force. <laughs> <laughs> just because it was so fucking cool um, but uh, that's class but you can literally <laughs> talk about you can like to talk about that tour all day man you got any other uh, tips on it? Um, um, nah I've always had that debate with people like because uh, obviously we've done ops in the Kandahar area and in Helmand don't we and I, I've always said that the Kandahar area, the Heart of Darkness, was by far the most, the more dangerous than Helmand. Yeah, hundred percent. And I always remember we were, we were getting I mean, orders for. I mean, I mean, like um, places like Sangin, if you're ground holding, like fuck me, that's that's dangerous. That's more. Yeah. I would say that's more dangerous than what we were doing. But yeah. in the broad scheme of places, like. The yeah the the Kandahar region and especially the places we were going was fucking very very sketchy because there wasn't yeah. any ground holding troops there there was no real there was nobody really cutting about apart from the BRF who'd rock up two days before us sort of thing um, and just poke the hornets nest <laughs> they'd get <laughs> everyone ready in their firing positions and shit like that it was funny send them the jocks no, I remember <laughs> getting orders mate for. Uh... I can't remember what op it was. It was in Kandahar anyway. And it was the Canadian and American like EOT team. I remember getting a break from the ops, mate. Uh, the order, sorry. And the Canadian guy came out with the American guy and they got their fucking spit bottles and stuff. I'm like, yeah, so how many, um, how many of you guys are, are actually going? So I'll just a company's worth, mate, probably like maybe 120 max. Is it for... For the whole lot, yeah, for the whole lot, mate. It's like, fuck, man, these guys are mental. He's like, what are you on about? And he was in, he was actually there like two weeks before, and they had to get like tanks to come and fucking rescue them, mate. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, fuck it, mate. A couple of Chinooks in we go. It'll be all right. <laughs> 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 yeah, I was talking to my mate about the US Marines, and he was saying that when he was training with them, that, that like they just, everything they'd done was just in extreme numbers. And Everything, every move they made was like with fucking Humvees and all these like uh, tactical uh, light armored infantry fucking vehicles. And like and the Marines were just, you know, yomping um, to positions and, you know, 
doing the same ranges with just fucking minimal guys. Just like, you know, they're taking on um, a tw- 20 guy range with, or 20 enemy range with a company like, like as you're meant to do. And then he was saying that the Marine, the, the U S Marines were taking like full battalions and do this sort of thing. And they were bringing in like warthogs and fucking everything for the, for the, uh, <laughs> the, for the range. And then you just got a Marine platoon rocking up just like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, cutting about me. Yeah. Oh. But it's a massive difference, man. Like, and I, I just, there's definitely a difference in quality. Definitely. Yeah. Unquestionable. I, I watched, um, I watched a thing on Amazon a couple of days ago, mate, called Combat Obscura. All right. And it was about the American Marines in, in Afghan. Uh, and they had like two guys with Adobe to be like the, the the press men with the fucking cameras recording everything. And mate, they were fucking smoking hash with the A and A. Like one one of their mates got fucking shot in the head, and they were like trying to cast back in, but you know he was still alive. And they were putting the first field dressing on, and he was like slumped over, and they're just like fucking throwing him against the wall, and and just watching it, mate. So I always had this like impression of the American Marines that they were like fucking. It switched on, and you know the creme de la creme. And then I watched that, and it like totally changed my perspective about them. Like chip shop is fuck, unbelievable, mate. But then that, you know that might just be the just a, a bad bunch of the whole core. Do you know what I mean? But uh, change changed my perspective on like, watching that. Yeah, I seen you know just in like YouTube videos and stuff like that, and like just uh, documentaries and stuff like. You pick up things that you're like, what the fuck? Like you would never be seen dead doing some of the things that you see, or some of the actions that you see the guys taking, or even just the the way in which the the command operate. You're just like, Jesus Christ, man! Like what what the British do like very well is like they encourage critical thinking, sort of thing. Yeah. So, um, you know, if there's a problem there in front of you, fucking fix it, and then ask for forgiveness rather than ask for permission first and let the problem develop uh, yeah. which I think is the opposite way in the US military I think it's let get permission first and then fix the problem no matter how bad the problem's getting <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, um, yeah. and, uh, and every man's not every man in the, in, in the British army is encouraged to be a thinking soldier whereas it's the complete opposite it's, it's make sure you go through your chain of command first before you, you take an action don't do anything yeah. until you're told to do that action um, yeah. In the, in the states but um yeah i mean like hats off to anyone that's doing doing that job though it's like like we can highlight a, we can highlight our opinions and say that we like me and you feel that there's a difference in quality and the reason why there's a difference in quality and still have respect for every one of them it's not as yeah. if we're saying that they're that, like they're dog shit and that, that their service isn't valued of course it is but we can at the same time we can just have a, a an opinion about them yeah, I don't want to discredit anyone like that, but um, <clears throat> um, Andy fucking they let us use their helicopters for pretty much every operation and fucking fizz in the night. Yeah, I mean, if it, if it wasn't for them, mate, we would have had what two chinooks between a fucking battle group. We've had about fucking <laughs> twenty trips to fucking get a, a company on the on the ground. Um, <laughs> yeah. Talking about that, actually, I remember like going to Sangin. And it's like a forty odd minute, forty five minute journey from uh, from Kandar. Um, yeah, I remember rightly. I remember falling asleep in this helicopter. I don't know, it was like maybe one in the morning or whatever. And I remember falling asleep, and uh, I don't know how long I'd been asleep, but I ended up getting woke up by the the door gunner doing a test fire on of his fucking chain gun. And I, <laughs> I was sat, so like I was I was obviously here, and like the door gunner was here. The chain gun was like fucking going past my head. Uh, and he obviously wasn't interested in whether I was awake or not. He just fucking test firing his gun. Um, yeah. yeah, I was a fucking sleep and I woke up. I said, "Wow!" I thought my fucking I thought we'd crashed or something like that. But um, yeah, fucking class time. Good times. Right? Imagine we could have fucking cashed in our air miles, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Rich. Fucking mental. It'd be interesting to see how much like. Um, like distance and stuff, we actually were covering. Yeah, it must yeah, have been it was a lot. Some, some amount of flying. Yeah, it must have been a lot. I done, I done like a on a a security assistance op. It was like uh, for their local election, um, yeah. and it was basically like the Chinooks were going out 
to pick up all these ballot boxes and they needed a section per Chinook. Or was it a section for the entire thing? I can't really remember. But anyway, like basically it was the job was to just sit in the helicopter all day and anytime they would land, just go and provide fucking force protection. So yeah. it was fucking pretty cool, mate. Like I got loads of cool photos, um, literally flying all the way up to like um Pakistani border, um a way out to the the east, and then pretty much all the way from Kandahar back again, like just going all the way up to the top and coming back and like stopping at fucking shit ton of locations, picking up ballot boxes and stuff. Um and it was interesting to see like more of the country and like uh, some of the natural fucking features of the country and then different fobs and stuff. We ended up landing in the US uh, base to get refueled and then, you know, carried on. But I think all in all, it was like a 10 hour sort of, it wasn't even enough, it was just 10 hour tasking. It was pretty yeah. cool. Um, you know, we were like fucking getting head down on the, on the, on the Chinook and stuff like that. Like while they were going from place to place, it's, you know, it's fucking pretty cool. Um, you got any other things you want to add on, add on that? Um, nah, mate, because it's probably going to be like one of the main talking topics of your your podcast when you get all the all the guys on. Don't headache ten. I don't think you'll, anyone will ever stop talking about it. To be honest with you. Yeah, I know. Um, and that's it. I don't think it should. Though it's like you fucking let's hear what you've got to say. Yeah, I mean that that was that's that was like on record as like, the bloodiest summer. Out of out of the headaches. Well, yeah. So, um, that was the most deaths recorded in one six month um, period, like one tour yeah. essentially um, of that of of Afghanistan, and we ended up doing the biggest. Is it the biggest air assault since World War Two? Yeah, yeah, the biggest yeah. air assault since World War Two. And we're not even we're not even fucking an airborne unit or anything. We just we just managed to end up like that. So, yeah, it's a good accolade to um, to having the books. Um, but yeah, it was fucking that time was amazing, mate. And th- and then all the support and stuff that you've got in Kandahar and stuff. So you're going out and doing these tasty ops, and then you come back to Kandahar and you you've got the boardwalk and you've got American cookhouses and <laughs> yeah. I remember getting picked up by a. a I now know what I now know. Uh, um, a CP bloke. At the time, I just thought, "Fucking hell, this like American cunt in a fucking a B six uh, Land Rover or whatever it's called." Um, me jump in his fucking wagon. He's giving a lift down to Scoff, and I go to put the door closed, and it weighs about a fucking ton. Jesus Christ! I was like, I, mean, I was like, mate, is this thing armored? He's like, yeah, man, yeah. Stop this or stop collection of cars seven six two short. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, mate, fucking hell, chill. Um, and anyway, he's just ranted like non stop, he's on permanent send. And then uh, <laughs> you get to the cookhouse, and I cannot remember who I was with, but somebody had stole something out of his wagon. <laughs> you get the cookhouse, <laughs> like, look, look at this, look what I took out of uh, that guy's wagon. It was something silly, like a fucking I don't know, a coaster or something like that, but. Um, I had like fucking canned our airfield on whatever his job role was, uh, job role was or whatever. But um, yeah, like you just get fucking picked up and lifts and shit down to scoff and good times in there. Yeah, it was man. It was just the size of it, mate. It was like a 15 20 minute walk just to get to like the closest cook house to like where we were. <laughs> I know it was a mile there every morning before you even got a fucking munch in your absolute liberty. I always remember we because we got extra pay, didn't we? Because of the noise off the the runway. Eventually, yeah, I can remember that being like a contentious issue when I first got there. And we were getting paid more than the people in the fobs. <laughs> they were living in worse <laughs> conditions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're they're living like burning shit every day. We're shimping because the the harriers are making too much noise taking off. <laughs> Disturbing our sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was weird. I actually seen something on LinkedIn the other day. I don't know if you remember, but uh, well, about a month ago now. But remember the har- uh, the the jet that went came into land and its front landing gear was stuck up. Yeah. And it landed and then skidded in the runway and like caught fire, yeah. and then uh, the yeah. pilot ejected. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I remember I, that popped up on LinkedIn the other day. Um, well, yeah, like last month or whatever, and I was like, "Fucking hell!" Like the the news article of it. So I left a wee comment and stuff like that, saying I was like, I was there at the time. I remember this happening. Um, but like, so, like I never seen any of the pictures of actually what happened. And then obviously in the article, it was all there, like the pilot, like fucking mid air ejecting about I don't know twenty meters above the fucking jet as it's like on fire, skidding down the runway and shit. And then you know. like the picture of like where the pilot landed in like his uh his ejector seat and all that sort of stuff. Fucking crazy. Remember getting told about yeah, this fucking happened today about this uh, jet crash landed and all that. I was like, Jesus, about three hundred meters away. <laughs> But, times, uh, just madness. What were you up to after that then? What, what's next in the pipeline? Um, so done done seniors, mate, and then went to A Company. Went over to A Company. Um, so yeah, the right round about. So when I was in A Company, mate, it was um, obviously that incident happened in Auburn. Uh, John McPherson getting shot. So yeah, I was, I was involved in that, mate. So it's quite, uh, you know, after everything you've been through in ops, you know, like not nothing like that, like affected me as much. Whereas that training incident has probably like affected me more than be than being on ops because you you don't expect any of that to happen on train. Obviously, the, the risk is there, the risk is always there, mm-hmm. but you just don't expect it to happen. Yeah. Just give a, a brief overview, overview for people that don't know what you're talking about, about what happened. Yeah, so um, we were conducting, um, it was at the Battalion's Battle Camp for um, Wessex Storm, so you did the live firing phase to start off with. We were in Otterburn, and uh, yeah, one, one of the first ranges we done was a fire team attack, day and night. And it was at night time, so it was a black attack, um, no loom. And... Yeah, so like the, the first attack went pretty well because it was, you know, we got, had the ambient light from the moon and stuff, but then it went quite dark, quite quick. And then the second attack, yeah, didn't go, didn't go too well. The young, uh, young with first ended up getting shot in the head, the total freak accident. Um, I remember being, so I was the target up for that uh, range of standing with, um, with uh, the RCO, Mr. Mitchell. And, yeah, I just remember like standing. So we were up on the, the bank looking down, and I remember the range starting, and then it was like you just heard someone shout "stop." And I remember saying to Mister Mitchell, "Fucking hell, that range has finished quite quick." And then the light came on, and I remember Meth like shouting, "Fucking medic, medic!" So I ran down. I went back to the range. I got the stretcher. Like fucking sprinted down. Didn't know what was happening. No, I just thought you know he would have broke his leg or whatever. And, uh, yeah, it wasn't until, like, Meth was like, fuck, wellsie has been fucking, I think he's been shot in the head. His ear defence is, like, lying on the floor sort of thing. So we, like, tilted his head over to the side, mate, and you could just literally see it, like, just fucking just coming out. So, yeah, we, we got him on the stretcher. Uh, obviously, the jocks on the range at this time are just there because they're not allowed to move because, you know, you know yourself, if an incident happens on the range, they've got to just stay there until... So they're on the range, they're seeing all this happening. Um, get them on the set, she would take them up to the hard standing. Um, yeah, just waiting for the paramedics to come. Uh, it was weird, mate, because like Meth and um, Bob Kane, they were like holding his, his head. I was chest compressions, mate. And remember, we, we touched Robo? Yes. So he was like holding his hand, mate. And um, Mr. Bloom was there like, uh, reassuring him, talking away and stuff. And I, I don't know, so it, it took like four or five minutes, mate, for the like the civvy ambulance to come. Uh, and you know when you're like, on the range and you know you get the safety brief and say, yeah, so if anything happens, then ambulance, we the ambulance at like ERV fucking ERV1, then we'll like, escort them in. And in your head, you're like, well, the ambulance know where ERV1 is. But when you'll see, like, phoned the ambulance, because because it was a head injury, you're sending a HLS, like a helicopter to come in and stuff. But he, like, said to the ambulance, she me, like, we'll meet you at the um, FRV Bravo and we'll escort you in. And the ambulance driver was like, where's that? Like, you need to talk to me on the map. So he's, like, on the map trying to 
Yeah. Like read him right and like a, a real a real time fucking tom tom sort of thing. You know, even had fucking range control that would be would go and meet them at the entrance to the range. Nah, it was and, it's and so all the, that the exercising area. Yeah, all so all that's kind of like uh so the range was only ten minutes away from the camp, mate, and in the camp was where the obviously the med center was and stuff like that. And it took like the BFA like twenty minutes, twenty, twenty five minutes to actually get to us. Yeah. yeah. Where where the breakdown was was um if uh, an incident happens and you've got to go through like the auto burn option and then they like control it from there. So it's almost like second hand information getting passed up and that's what took the time for people to actually get the ground. But um but yeah it was uh you know the, I don't have like not like a sixth sense of humor, but you know, I was like cracking jokes and stuff. I was like trying to trying to speak to him and I was like, fucking hell mate, you'll do anything to get off an exercise sort of thing. Yeah, you know, was just, just like yeah, it's hard to explain, but anyway, I was like fucking I was doing the chest compressions and whatnot, and I'm the civvy paramedic guy came, hooked him up to the machine and he's like, look, just like stop the, the chest compressions, so I like, stopped. And then like nothing flatlined. He said, okay, like start them again. So I started again, then he got like a bit of a pulse. So I was basically kept them alive for all that time, mate. But then, you know, it's like fucking hell. Like you start to think, so I kept them alive for all that time. Was he in pain for that time? But you do was I doing more worse than good sort of thing? Yeah, well yeah. pain's a pain's part of the nervous system and like you only you only feel the pain if the nervous system's working. If like like if the brain wasn't working, then you're not going to feel the pain. You know. Um, was it was it like any sort of response coming from at all? Well, you know, we, we we're like speaking to him and stuff, and I don't know if we were like imagining it. You know, you can see the odd smile, or like we were over. He was like holding his hand. And he's always just squeeze my hand. So we don't know if we were like you not know, giving ourselves like false hopes. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, so God knows me. There's, no there's nothing obvious. It was just slight things that you might, you, you know, you might be making up or you might be. There was I mean, no yeah, so. Communication. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was extraordinary, but, you know, get it. So, yeah. And yeah, I, I obviously wasn't there, but, like, what it sounds like, it sounds like it was like an instantaneous sort of death and then because when you do those cr- chest compressions and like what this what the what the um monitor's picking up is just the the fact that there's blood flowing yeah it's not it's not picking up whether the guy's conscious and alive it's just picking up whether there's blood flowing and so you yeah. buy comp- chest compressions up the, that then that's then forcing the blood around so like, you know, I, yeah. wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't hold on to that as like a thing that you kept him alive in pain sort of thing. It's like, you know, if you've been shot in the head, it's pretty likely that you, you're going to die outright. Um, and then you can manually make blood flow around the body by doing chest impressions afterwards. And Yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah I only learned this on like the, the med course. I had to do part of the CP stuff. Um, yeah. And then obviously, I'm sure you know that like, afterwards that like, you get, you know, twitches and stuff. In the body that's yeah. just, you know, uh, that come irregularly and unnaturally. So yeah, maybe you, maybe there was a, a couple of hand squeezes, and maybe you were getting a wee smile or something. But it might have been, you know, uncontrollable twitches of the body, and you know, you, you know, like I said, I don't know what happened, but by the sounds of things, it probably was was the case. That it just it was an instant death. Has there been yeah, any sort of like willing, or has there been any sort of final um outcome of that situation um yeah so you know they've, they've done the investigation and stuff and published uh, the investigation online with the findings and stuff like that so they, they think that one of the guys is actually like shot him by accident but, um yeah I, I won't say his name and stuff you know because it's probably yeah. a good t- they'll touch you but yeah so they, they reckon one of one of the guys accidentally mistaken them for for a target and uh, shot him. Yeah, so, I mean, again, again, no, um, 
fucking black attack at night you know it's 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 called a it's called a black attack because you can't see shit it's because it's black um, yeah exactly yeah you can't see your targets you can see silhouettes and um if you see a silhouette that looks like a fucking target then you know you know if you unhappy if you happen to be in the wrong place by a sheer um bunch of shit events that's led up to that or you make a fucking wrong move then that's the consequences and that's why infantry training in the in the british army is so fucking so good because there's so much on the line you know if you met if you get it up it's you know tragic but if you get it right then you get so much fucking experience from it so yeah uh, definitely and i think it's I think it definitely needs to continue at that at that level because if you start ramping it back and taking away the the realism and you know the you know you, you stop if you, imagine imagine you just stopped doing black attacks your yeah. first contacts at night you'd be completely fucked and, I, and you know contacts at night and stuff like that they're going to be ten times worse on ops and they would be in a safe range when you've got guys running behind you telling you when to stop firing and telling you where to move and telling you. You know when someone's running in front of you so you know it's it's obviously like i said it's a travesty that this happened um but you need to be training at the level that you're going to be on an ops and this is as close as you can get a black attack at night it's, you know it doesn't get much uh much tougher than that yeah 100 yeah. percent. yeah it needs to be yeah but um i mean uh, i mean like kfc so he was out of seven at the time Fucking can't fault him, mate. Like gleaming bloke. Obviously, he's been through his own experiences and stuff like that with uh, his injuries. And actually, just having him there, like to talk to, you know, like he. So him and the C also came into the range, mate. And they took us to the side and just, you know, unreal, mate. Honestly, like you can't fault him. And you know, quite a lot of people didn't rate the C at the time there, but. The way that they like handled it and actually like supported the people involved at the time was fucking unreal. Yeah. yeah. And I remember so then um, 2018, mate, was we were on Shader. I came back early to do my boxing coaching course. And then um, first in his name was getting put on the you know the wall at the Arboretum. Right, okay. Yeah, his name was getting put on that, mate. So I got a chance to go down and like with his family to like watch them like on like reveal his name and stuff. It was quite good. But um Colonel Steele actually came to that mate. Like he was so I, I can't remember what job he had at the time, but um like the the defence secretary was coming to the the name revealing because there's another six, seven guys getting uh, added to the wall. So like he came to it and Colonel Steele heard at the time from his office that morning about what was going on and he heard that McPherson's name was getting put on the wall and he like jumped on the helicopter with him mate and like came like I, I seen him there and he's like fucking hell well is he like shoot my hand like, talking away to him and I, I'd never been there before mate like, I'd obviously seen pictures of it have you been yourself have you? and uh, the National War Mo- uh, Memorial the, the Ar- Arborate- Arboretum no 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 nah so it's like um it's on like massive grounds, mate, and there's a uh, there's a wall there that's got loads of names from all the conflicts of people who have died. Mm-hmm. And um yeah, so like after the ceremony it was weird, mate. He like came up to me. He said, Oh Wells, if you come with me and he put his arm around me and took me over to the to the two thousand and nine panel. And, like the guys from the uh, Herrick Ten, they're on that panel, mate. So it's quite surreal. He's like, Yeah, look this, you know, there's the guys from Herrick Ten. Yeah, just like talking to me, just like a, it was quite a sound book anyway. But it was a, a different side that I seen to him. Still, yeah, yeah. I uh, I always had the utmost respect for him. Like uh, he was my company commander on, uh, on Eric Ten. You know, I've, I've for me he was my best CEO. Um, and I was yeah. you know great fucking company commander as well. Probably my best company commander as well. Um, you know. I, I've got nothing but respect for him as well. And then just obviously hearing that, it's just fucking, it's just a, a credit to him. Um, everyone's got their own opinions on, you know, yeah, a whole bunch of people. Everyone's going to have people that like them. Everyone's going to have people that don't. But yeah, I fucking, I always thought he was top, top draw. Like I was, I was glad when he, when he got named as he was coming back to the battalion to, to take over CO. Um, yeah, yeah. 
and a, a couple of them were him and Kev. Was it him and Kev that was sealed uh, RSM together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a gleaming coupling. You know, it's really good. Um, but yeah, that's a fucking that's a, sh- a total shit situation, and it's just one of those things. Like it, it shouldn't have happened, but it happened, and it's just the the, yeah. the harsh realities of being an infantry soldier. You know, you, you have to train at the level that's you know you're bordering on you know being da- being dangerous to train. You know, you you need to get to that level so that when it comes to real life, that you've already experienced something similar. You know. Sometimes yeah, you, you just tip the scale that one too many times, and it's, you know something bad happens. But yeah. have you had any like um, counsel or anything, or do you need any, or have you thought about it in terms of? Um, I mean, yeah. So like, the, obviously, trim got put in place. Um, yes, yeah, so we got trimmed and stuff. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm either I've not got the brain the brain capacity, or you know, but. It affected me at the time, but see now, that obviously I still get a bit upset talking about it and stuff, but it doesn't really affect me much where I need to like seek help. Yeah. Um, but yeah, at the time, yeah, we all got trimmed at the time, obviously you need you need that to get that tick in the box that you're you're saying to like carry on sort of thing. Yeah. I've, uh, I've, played, around, I've played around with the idea of uh, being proactive and like going to see a counsellor just like I've got nothing wrong with me now, but I've, I've played around with the idea that if I was to be proactive and go and see someone, like before anything starts, and just to like you know be documented that I've like that I've spoke to somebody and that they've assessed me, um, you know, and they can give me fucking advice and if I am you know maybe like like going off the wire a wee bit here or there. They can, you know, give me guidance and like say, right, maybe this is something that you don't need anymore. Maybe this is something that you could actually maybe use uh, a bit more and come back maybe once a month or maybe once a year or something like that. I don't know, but I thought about playing around with it, just proactively going to see somebody. Like, like I said, I've got nothing wrong with me, but yeah, you know, it's, it's just something that I was thinking about recently. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's something that needs to be talked more openly about. You know, it's not. Not not necessarily your feelings, but it's your your mental health. Like everyone's going to have fucking you know feelings about all sorts of things, but it's your mental health that you you can't control your mental yeah. health unless it unless you understand that there's a problem there. And nine times out of ten, guys aren't willing to understand or even admit there's a problem. And if they do yeah. have the problem, and they're they're definitely well not definitely, but they're more likely not to voice their opinion. Um, and the big point, the big issue with that and which i've got an issue of is the fact that if you voice it voice it and that you've got a problem with mental health while you're still serving then that's it your career's fucking stopped immediately like yeah. to the point where like if you're an infantry soldier you're not allowed to touch a weapon like that's your job um yeah. so i think maybe if you were to maybe to say right this person's got a mental health problem He's dealing with some stressful situations, which is going to come because of the fucking job. It's a stressful job. But he's not at risk of suicide. He's not at risk of harming anyone else. He's just struggling mentally. Let him let him be part of the community still. Let him still do his job. Give him a sense of purpose. And then only when it becomes a risk to others and to himself, then say, right, this guy's talking about suicide. He said he's, you know, he's he's, he's you know, he's wanting to hurt someone else, then say right that's what you're on you know you're on weapons hole and you're not allowed to you know touch weapons but i think just saying going in there and say oh, i'm depressed and then and then the doctor saying right that's it no more fucking weapon handling for you you're on a biff chip you can't do this you can't do that you can't go and exercise then what how is that fucking helping like you've just taken away everything that, that man that that bloke's capable of and everything that he feels um married to sort of thing so that doesn't help any cunt um but yeah maybe if you looked at different and said look no suicide risk whatsoever um no harm to anyone else just dealing with some fucking shit at the the minute let them crack on you know do all what exercise weapon handling ranges everything at normal but just come and see some counseling that may be a fucking much better idea and it's probably going to actually uh, take the stigma away from 
guys seeking help. 100%. Um, I, I recently touched base again with one of the American section commanders I was with out in um, on Shader, mate. So a couple of, I think it was about two months ago, one of his soldiers committed suicide. And um, he he's came up with his own thing in America and it's hit off quite quite big, mate, called uh, Story Time. So maybe try and look it up on uh, Insta. And his understanding is he's like all for um, another 25 press ups, 25 days and stuff like that. He's, he's all for that, but he says it doesn't really help. Well, it's good for raising awareness, but you know, 25 press ups isn't going to stop somebody from, you know, killing himself. They're not going to go on Facebook and be like, oh, he's done his 25 today. I'm just going to, I'm not, I'm not going to do it today, sort of thing. So he's come up with a thing called Story Time, mate. And uh, so the date that his, his soldier died on was like the 22nd of, I don't know, I think it was um, May or something like that. So he's, he's come up with a thing where like the 22nd of each month, if you reach out to, somebody you've not spoke to in fucking years, give them a wee phone, give them a wee check in, mate, and just see how they're getting on. Do you know what I mean? And I think that is quite good in a way. It's hit off in America massive, mate. But he's, I've got, he's sending over like bumper stickers now over to me. And oh, he's, yeah. he's like constantly fucking messaging me. But you know, the, and I can see where he's coming from with it all. And you know, I think it's quite a good idea. And it's probably similar to your podcast, mate. Do you know what I mean? just helping people event and stuff not no pressure of going to see going to the doctor or speak to like dcmh you know you're just sitting chatting shit and mm. you know it's, it's good mate and it that that is better than doing your 25 press-ups and plus i can't i probably can't do 25 press-ups mate. <laughs> <laughs> well the, the, i don't don't get me wrong i've done the 25 press-up stuff stuff in the past and like at the time, it, I don't know. Like my opinion now is, but like I wouldn't fucking do them. I would just donate yeah. money to somebody that's yeah, like, exactly. Somebody that's needing help, or I would actually like, like you said, reach out to somebody and stuff like that. Posting you doing twenty-two press ups is, you know, it's kind of narcissistic. It's kind of vain. It doesn't actually achieve anything. Um, and I think that like yeah. it's. It was it was good at the start, no, because it was actually genuine veterans going about doing it, and you know, and it was getting people, you know, active again. But and now, mate, it's like other people are jumping on the bandwagon. So there's like I've seen people pop up my Facebook, like civvy chicks doing it. Like I'm doing the 25 press ups because I feel like I suffer from anxiety and the way that I look. Yeah. Let's raise awareness, and so well, no, that's not what it's for. Yeah. I can give it's the, it's the exact same thing now with the clap for the NHS shit. Uh, yeah. Like, listen, the NHS has done a fucking good job. They've been doing a good job since they fucking started. And uh, now they've got a big fucking, a big task on their hand. Um, clapping your hands on a Thursday night at eight o'clock is doing fuck all for anyone. Everyone yeah. is, everyone's uh, appreciative of the work that they're putting in the, at the minute or in the, you know, while it was going on. But the best thing you can do is fucking go around to your neighbor and say, look, do you need a hand with anything? Do you need me to fucking get your, get your Adobe done? Or do you want me to fucking go and get your shopping or something like that? Don't fucking just stand on your doorstep and clap your hands. Cause it, like, like the 22 press ups thing, it doesn't do anything for any kind. Yeah. Donate money to a charity, like an NHS charity. Go and fucking actually do something. Just one thing. Like maybe even just reach out and say, leave them a, uh, an Instagram message or a Facebook message. That's way more fucking um, helpful to these people than it is just doing a fucking, you know, a, a self, um, um, mate, see, see this. I can't fucking, my, my brain's too good for my mouth. I can't get the fucking words out. <laughs> A self-promoting fucking task like press ups or, or clapping. Yeah. And like you yeah. said, people are now jumping on the bandwagon uh about being key workers and it's like key workers deserve this, key workers deserve that. Like, look, NHS is the only real key workers that you've got. Everyone else is just doing their job. Like going to work and stack the shelves at Tesco's, it's a fucking job. It's it's always just been a job. Is it admirable? Yeah, because it's a fucking job. You're getting up and you're going to work and you're doing a hard day's work. An honest day's work, just like every job's fucking the same, like cleaners and all these fucking tasks that have, you know, uh, had to keep keep going on for 
COVID. Um, but the 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 level of self entitlement that comes from that now that I'm seeing, you know, is is damaging to the actual good work that people have been doing, um, and it's starting to undermine it all. Um, like I've seen, I've seen that some, uh, I've seen that uh, somebody was giving away NHS workers' holidays to Ibiza for a week for free, and then I went in the comments because I knew what they were going to be like. What about the fucking army that have been deployed? What about the fucking shelf stackers? What about my gran who's been isolated for four months and uh, had to get her, her shop and delivered? What about this? What, I'm like, see all you self, you know, fucking, it's, it's all about what, what am I getting out of it? It should never yeah. be that. It should be like, what can I give someone else? Like, how can I serve somebody else better? Yeah, and it was the same with them. Um, so you used to see like, uh, I'm a key worker, is there anywhere I can get my car emoted? <laughs> or, or they'll like post pictures of uh, I'm a key worker on night shift, look what fucking McDonald's has dropped off to us and it's like fucking 20 odd Big Macs and stuff. Like, fuck off, like, who cares? Like, where, I'm, you- where I'm working now, it's like, um, um, and I, I'm not meant to say who, the, who it is, but it's a fucking technology company that's, you know, world leading. And all yeah. the all the customers coming in, they're like, um, "Yeah, I'm actually a, an NHS key worker. Um, is there <laughs> any way that I can just get straight in and not have to wait in this queue?" I'm like, "Are you taking the piss?" Like in my head, I'm like, hey, "Fucking here we go again." I just I'm just like, "No, sorry, you're just gonna have to wait like everyone else." Oh well, I just came off a night shift, a 16 hour night shift, blah blah, and I'm like, "Fucking probably full of shit anyway." But yeah. no, you're just gonna have to wait. And like this is like the, the dangerous thing about that is like I see the self entitlement just you know in this rising, um, and these what these key workers should really be doing is being humble about it. When somebody asks what did you do during COVID, it's like oh I was actually stacking shelves the whole time in fucking Sainsbury's or whatever. And then it's like right, then you get your recognition. You don't go around yeah. getting your recognition by telling everyone that you're a key worker. It's like, and I bet out of that, like, 16-hour night shift, it was, like, 15 hours making fucking TikTok videos and actually one <laughs> hour, like, what, one hour saving somebody's life, do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, these people that come up and see me day and day. 15 most hours. Of them are probably, they're probably not even key workers, but just try 15 to hours making TikTok videos, eating your free fucking scoff. I mean, one hour actually doing your work. <laughs> Maybe. Um, yeah, so you, you've talked a couple of times about Shader. Like, um, how was that going back to Iraq? And, like, I know it was a completely different uh, different tour for you. Yeah, so it was actually uh, uh, Al Ambar province, mate. Uh, maybe west, of, west of Baghdad, quite close to the, the Syrian border. Um, in an airbase, Al Assad airbase. Um, so, our company, a company, we were like the, the sec for security. And there was the company of jocks, um, two platoons of Americans, and then two platoons of Danish. And then Delta Company, they were actually doing like the training side of things and whatnot. But um, yeah, totally different kettle of fish, mate. So, Al Assad airbase, the way. The, it's hard to describe what it was like an onion, mate. So if you imagine the middle of the onion, there's like the the main airbase where we all stayed, where the coalition forces stayed. And then the, the next bit of onion to that was like the Afghan fucking air force. And then the next bit was like the army. And then it was just like pure open dash. Right. But, um, I mean, it was, the jocks put in a graph, mate. They, they were staggering on that Sanger flight fucking... Like 12 hours a day. Do you know what I mean? A shift and a sanger, mate, and then getting the rest off. And, you know, putting up with the heat and then the bullshit. And then, you know, it was just, uh, it was a graft. But it was, it wasn't, it wasn't hard, but it was, you know what I mean? Yeah. What did, what was the sanger set up like? Was it literally just that empty sanger? Or was there any sort of like, um, how was it being run? Was it running pairs or was there any sort of like fucking chance or downtime or? Yeah, so there'd be two in a sanger, mate, and it was uh, the typical wooden sanger with the sandbag. 
Right, okay. So very, very they're quite, yeah, American ones, mate, quite well built. Um, so what they would do is if they were on, so it was like broken down to sectors, mate, um, each sector had like six sangers, and then you had like the main gate, the front gate. So I think that the, the busiest you would be was if you're on the front gate, mate, because you've got, you control the access in the camp sort of thing. But if there was like casualty exchanges and stuff, so you'd get the, the Iraqi army would like Kazi back into like, the main Assad med center and they'd like hand over at the gate. So that's probably as good as it got. You know, if one if we've got a casualty exchange, mate, then you know, like, past your time like fucking squaring that away. Mm-hmm. But um yeah, it was good actually working with, you know, because you people say they work with the Americans, but they're not actually you well, know, they're probably just in the same base as the Americans. But we were actually like working with them and it was, it was quite good and the Danish as well mate it was really good quite a good experience actually what sort of things did you pick up in terms of like um, you know differences in how they operate or you know just general observations about the Danish and Americans um, so the Danish mate they've got all the gear all their gear is cry gear mate and they're fucking you know the jocks tend to swap their their sweaty fucking Alpha Company PT t-shirt for a I cry fucking you back top. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah, I mean the, the Americans mate, well, everyone loves the jocks, don't they? The, the Americans fucking you know, the some of the jocks have got like still go and like speak to the Americans. I think one of them actually went out and lived with them on their pottle and stuff like that. So it's quite good, mate. And um the, the Danish they were good to work with. They're a weird bunch, but you know, they they, they kept themselves to themselves. But then, you know, they had the Gucci fucking cafe where you just had to go and put like a dollar in and you got all the coffee you wanted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fucking robbed them as well. Like yeah. I could catch them from the wire, mate. <laughs> You're well resourced. Yeah, but now it was quite good, mate. Uh, quite restrained what we could do as well. So there used to be a company of American Marines in the security force and they had the uh, ground sensors out and so anything out with the base was the red zone so they had like ground sensors in the red zone and we used to have to go out and change the batteries and then but when they went up to the Syrian border they took the ground sensors away from them, right so we lost that capability sort of thing mm-hmm. and we kept asking you know, well if there's no ground sensors can we go and patrol it like as you would patrol the dead ground and uh, nah, you're not allowed. You need to get like permission from fucking from wherever. You're not allowed to leave the camp. You know, so it was quite it was shit that way. But um Yeah, a completely yeah. different task in it, doesn't it? Yeah. But the the Iraqis ran the show, mate. They so you had to get uh flying to Baghdad and then from Baghdad you had to get checked by the Iraqi customs before you could then fly anywhere in, into Iraq. And if they didn't like the look of the paperwork or the freight you were carrying, then they wouldn't let you fly. Really? You had to, yeah. So if they, if they were pissed off, you know, if you got some, some Iraqi who's pissed off, mate, fucking stagging on, he, he didn't like you were carrying like spare fucking wheels for the Mastiff, then nah, you, you, weren't, you weren't getting in, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no fucking, no, no jump tonight sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> fucking mental. I remember... Uh, um, you got a good bit of... Um... Uh, like uh, morale sort of stuff out in out in the states, didn't you? In terms of like American um, people coming to see you and stuff. Mate, um, UFC fighters, mate. That was like the fucking highlight. Like we we Paige Van Zandt, um, Max Holloway, Diego Sanchez. You know, it was unreal, mate. And then they, they took a. Uh, so we, we went. We done one show, mate. And. The the like the the American celebrities were late. So do you remember Full School Wally and the Pipes and Drums, the old guy, the old piper? Yeah. Looks about a hundred. <laughs> so he had he had his bagpipes, mate. And the American general was like, Yeah, so we've got like a piper from Free Scots and he's gonna play as a song. So he came out, played the fucking pipes, the Americans go mental, mate. His face is red, raw, fucking sweating comes off the stage and then they waited like another 10 minutes and nobody was coming. They were obviously late somewhere. And then the, the general came on the stage flapping like fuck. He's like, eh, okay, so they're late. Um, 
we've got the pipe, a piper from Free Scott saying what he gets fucking put back on the stage, mate. Plays another set, he's fucking hanging out at this point. <laughs> fucking <laughs> gets out off the stage again. He done it another two times, mate, and by like the fucking <laughs> <laughs> By the fifth time, he was fucking hanging out. Go try to blow the pipes up and that. Oh, yeah. fucking. <laughs> you could tell he was in club, mate. Mm. But, uh, no, it was good, mate. Like, and so they've got like a general, mate, and that's his sole job to fly out all these people out to visit all the Americans wherever they're deployed. Yeah. And he, get, he gets them in on like special visas, and you know, it was quite a big thing. Yeah, but no, it was quite new. You'll never get the chance to like see any of them, mate. And yeah. there was a country singer, I can't remember his name. He came with his band. He's, he's obviously quite big in America. And um, like at the end, he was like, Yeah, does, so does anyone like playing instruments or can anyone sing? And some American guy got up and said, Yeah, you know, I play the fucking, I play the drums. And they had this like mad box thing where they sit on it and they like play it like a fucking bongo sort of thing. He's like, oh, can you play this? He's like, yeah, I'll give it a try. So he went up, he like, fucking tried to play it. And ended up, like, signing this fucking drum box thing, mate. Yeah, this is yours, now you can keep it. He's like, anyone play the guitar? And they're like, yeah, I'll play the guitar. And he's like, fucking, play me a song, mate. And he, like, played him a song. And then, like, the, the main country singer guy was like, here you go, man. Here's my guitar. Send his guitar. Fucking give it to me. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Who, who did we have on Harry 10? Like, Freddie Flintoff came out, didn't he? And David Beckham. David Beckham, yeah. Can you imagine, like, Freddie Flintoff, like, dishing out fucking cricket bats, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I remember on Eric 15 now, we got choir singers, mate. <laughs> <laughs> they, came out, they came out and done a half hour, like, choir, choir performance in the fob, and I think it was 12 people rocked up. <laughs> Jocks all crying that it's beautiful as a fucking Where's a when I wanna call home? <laughs> fucking voices of angels, these cunts. <laughs> it's a different world, isn't it? Oh man, yeah, massive. It's just because they've got so much resources and so much money, it's a yeah. completely different fucking kettle of fish. Um right, well we'll probably kind of try and wrap it up here. I'll probably uh I'll, I'll just ask then. If you could go back and do something um, differently with the hindsight of what you know now, uh, what do you think that would be? Oh, fucking hell. Um, Dropping bombs on you at the end. I know, mate. Fuck. It's, I don't uh, know, mate. I think... I think, you know, that I would have probably tried to join something like knowing what I know now about the army and what there actually is out there we would have probably joined to get a trade of some sort but then I'm like well no you fucking idiot because then you wouldn't be in the position that you are now you know what I mean yeah you would have the experience you've had now but um, that's a tough one mate I don't yeah, know I, there's, I, always, there's always things that you, you think you no, know, when you've been in some situations, you always come away thinking that, you know, I should have done this better, I should have done that better. Yeah, but fuck knows, mate. You've caught me off, you've caught me off guard. <laughs> I would, um, I would try and, I would try and volunteer for more things. I mean, I volunteer, yeah. well, I felt like I volunteered for a lot, but I felt like I also turned a lot of opportunities away because I was too good for them, which is, you know, a ridiculous statement. Um, but that's the truth at the time. Like, I, I generally, you know, had a little bit of self-arrogance about myself. Um, and that came from the fact that I, all I wanted to do is do infantry shit. And, you know, I, I, f I felt like I was really good at my job. Um, and then I didn't want to go away and do a fucking a, a kayak and AT call. And I didn't want yeah. to go away and do... Um, a, set, a health and safety at work fucking call and I'm like you know like these sort of things come up and I'm like fuck that well like literally honestly every little thing that you do you learn something uh, yeah. and it's it may you know it may just be what fucking colour codes fire extinguishers are and that sounds yeah. stupid but if you've got a fucking electrical fire and you put water on it have you, let's say you've got a, a chip pan f uh, fire and you put water on it then you, you're essentially putting fucking diesel on it and making the fire yeah. ten bigger 
And it's just little things like that. Like it just make overall the more and more and more and more and more you do, the more and more and more you become a like a fully a well-rounded fucking individual. But at the time, I'm thinking. I've already got it squared away. I fucking know everything. You can't teach me shit. Like I'm the fucking dog's ball. Yeah. But like I would have yeah, just I would have just volunteered for more stuff. Quad yeah. license and shit like that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> nah, but yeah, like you said, mate, I mean, so since I've been here, there's been quite a lot of trolls came out to go and do like um short term training teams. And one came out for Lebanon, like over over Christmas time. Then, you know, I'm I'm thinking, oh, I want to do it, but then I'm like, well, no, because then I'm meant to be here, like, I've got a job here to do sort of thing, I'm like, to get away from a job, and I don't put my name down for it, but, you know, like, maybe I should, you know, see where it takes me, sort of thing. Mm. But, yeah, you'll never know. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's just like, um, coming to terms with, like, the fact that, for me, it was definitely, like, uh, education and building your, building your own self up is the best thing that an individual can do for you know like their mental health their personal progression and whatever they're going to be doing whether it be military whether it be coming out of the military like all these little skills they all add up uh, yeah. and like i say if like you're fucking ever in a situation when your house is on fire and you don't know what fucking shit to put it out with then you know <laughs> you know the, you, you might pick something like that up a useful skill like that on one of these shithole courses that sometimes come up and get offered for you but yeah, no, it's been no, no. an absolute fucking pleasure having you on. Um, and I, I fucking, this has been the longest one, I think. So nearly three hours. So um, that, yeah, that's, that's a credit to how interested I was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, like, I'm going to start doing these, um, releasing them on two uh, on Sundays at two o'clock. So that's, yeah. when, that, that's when this will go live. Um, and I'm sure you've seen on my, my Insta that the reason why is because so guys can get it in the car or on the train or whatever when they're going back up to camp or yeah, um, wherever they're fucking going on Sunday night course or whatever. Yeah, happy days, mate. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, well, we'll fucking uh, if you want, I'll come, come back on again in the future sometime. Um, we're always well, yeah, it has been an absolute pleasure, Wells. It thank you yeah. very much. Take it easy, mate. Take care, big man. Bye. All right, see you later.